Hello everyone, hope you're doing well. Uh, let's get rid of uh, Pepe off near there. Forgot about him. Uh, yeah, so yesterday we watched a couple of videos with Sinclair Lore, Cosmos, and the Honored Madman. So another commonly requested person that I should watch is Chard Thermos. And, well, a lot of people were requesting that I begin watching from his first video in his, like, Bloodborne playlist. The man himself asked me to look at this video specifically, Bloodborne Lore Extra, What Really Happened to Lawrence. So, after that, um, we have another video by Crunchy, and then these two videos are both lengthy, so I thought we could do a small one in between them. So, I picked another video by The Honored Man Man. Did Alexander Harvest General Redon? And funnily enough, I never really thought about it that way, but it really makes kind of a lot of sense, all things considered. So I'm interested to see uh, what else goes along in that video. And then we will finish up potentially with uh, Crunchy's video, who has also been in the chat at times, with Elden Ring lore, sex, rebirth, and false gods. Very interested in that. A uh, very good clickbait thumbnail there. And it seems like a very interesting video topping in general. So... We've got our videos lined up for us. Very interested to see what they're all about. So hope everyone's doing well. Sinclair Lore, Asinex, Mercy, Mortis. Nice to see all of you guys again. All right. So I have not seen a video by uh, Chard Thermos before, so this will be my first. So hopefully we don't need any additional context from his other videos, which I don't think so since he's the one who recommended this to us. So... Here we go. Bloodborne Lore Extra, What Really Happened to Lawrence by Chard Thermos. When we touch the skull on the altar of the Grand Cathedral, we observe a scene that we're led to believe is the final interaction between Lawrence and Willem. But what if I told you that this wasn't their last encounter, and that there's an untold chapter in their story that's been hiding in plain sight this entire time? What I'll present to you today, I believe, will completely upend everything we know about Lawrence and his place in Bloodborne's story. It'll also solidify beyond a shadow of a doubt the medical metaphor that I've argued serves as a central framework for the game. I was fairly confident about how From Software landed on the name Lawrence, and I summarized my thoughts on that matter in a previous episode of this series. But after further investigation, I can say with absolute certainty that I was wrong. Based on the information I'll share in this supplementary episode, I've come to the steadfast conclusion that it was a different real-life source who inspired Lawrence's name. And as we'll see today, this same real-life source was the inspiration for Lawrence's ultimate fate in the game. There's a body of evidence that indicates Lawrence and Willem ended their relationship under much different circumstances than we thought. Before we dive in too deeply here, I'm curious to see where he's going to go with this, and I wonder if Chard Thermos was aware that at least in one point in development, Lawrence was potentially called Ashton. Um, I don't really think that really changes much and of course the character of Ashton may not have actually been like the character of Lawrence there could have been like a shuffling of names and positions but uh I just maybe something to keep in mind as we continue watching this hey Mr. Mustache ICT welcome to the stream you said this one you can watch standalone but if you watch the others you have to watch them from the beginning thank you for the clarification As with any deep lore dive, the process of uncovering this secret won't be quick or easy. But fortunately, it won't be a slog. Um, I forgot about this, but there, like, he probably mentions this in one of his episodes, I'm assuming. But this is, like, the, like, plaque above this gate. And this gate, in general, is taken from, like, a real British medical facility. And I don't remember the details off the top of my head, and I wish I did. But I think it's probably mentioned on Meph's uh, Bloodborne wiki, if uh, anybody wants to look into that. Or it might even be pinned in my Discord. I don't remember. It's been quite a while since we've uh, really done a lot of Bloodborne content on this channel, unfortunately. So anyway, uh, that just seeing this just kind of reminded me of it. As we proceed through this episode, we'll make several game-changing discoveries that'll allow us to leave with a remarkable takeaway. Our journey today begins in an unlikely location 
and with an even unlikelier character. We commence with Dores, the mysterious grave guard of the Forbidden Woods. Everything we learn about Dores seems to come from the grave guard attire set, which we're told belonged solely to this character. Unlike the hunter attire sets and other church garb that was worn by many, if not all, members of these professions or institutions, the graveguard attire appears to have been worn specifically by Dores. The text of this attire collection is unusual, telling us that two servants of Master Willem went mad after encountering the Eldritch Truth in the labyrinth. The two servants, we're told, remained loyal to Willem even in madness. One became the gatekeeper, guarding the passageway to the Forbidden Woods with a password. The other, Dores, became a graveguard of the forest, the Forbidden Woods. Dores, a graveguard or gravekeeper, was assigned to this post, we can assume, not to tend to the thousands of graves littering the Forbidden Woods. Dores, it seems, was there to prevent people from accessing the area appropriately named the Forbidden Grave the final accessible site of the Forbidden Woods, which lies on the edge of the College of Bergenworth. Dores was guarding this grave as a servant of Master Willem of Bergenworth. That's what the in-game lore would have us believe. So what exactly was going on in this graveyard adjacent to Bergenworth? Whatever While this doesn't exactly correlate to what we get in-game, it's always been kind of my headcanon that... The Forbidden Woods and the Forbidden Graves may have been an access point into the Chalice Dungeons because that's where Bergenworth, I think, would have been most likely to begin their foray into the Chalices in their pursuit of the knowledge that was gained from encountering the Augur Verbritus first. But um, not trying to like talk over him, just kind of giving some of my perspective of like what I think before uh, I'm assuming he's going to challenge. Hey, Boris, nice to see you again. Whatever it was, Willem didn't want people to know about it. It was forbidden activity that must be kept secret. This seems logical considering the unnamed gatekeeper in Cathedral Ward serves a very similar purpose to Dora's. He prohibits anyone from accessing the Forbidden Woods unless they know the secret password, the sacred adage of Bergenworth. I think it's fair to say that for most of us, that's the extent of our knowledge of these two characters, who seem to have little to no bearing on Bloodborne's larger story. But based on what I'll show you today, I think we've grossly misinterpreted Dores, the Gatekeeper, and their impact on the story of Willem and Lawrence. First though, we need to do a bit of scene setting. I promise you, this will be worth the effort. Let's recap what we've previously concluded about Bergenworth. As we've noted many times before, Bergen is an old English word meaning burial place or grave. Bergenworth, therefore, could be considered the college of the grave, implying that the scholars of this college, this old place of learning, as Alfred calls it, were gaining knowledge by studying the contents of graves. That makes perfect sense considering they were delving into the tomb of the gods. As I noted in the final episode of my main series, the proximity of Bergenworth to the Forbidden Grave is a strong indication that the scholars of Bergenworth were digging through this graveyard to do their research. It seems reasonable to interpret that this is where they accessed the Tomb of the Gods and encountered this forbidden knowledge that drove Dores and the Gatekeeper mad. As we've also discussed at length, Bergenworth's grave exploration is a key part of Bloodborne's overarching medical metaphor. It's a dramatic interpretation of real-life medical and surgical research of the 1700s and 1800s that cuts through the entire game. In the Georgian and Victorian eras, the primary form of medical research was anatomical dissection. In the major cities of Great Britain, mainly London and Edinburgh, which were home to prestigious medical colleges and a number of private anatomy schools, there weren't enough dead bodies that could be legally obtained so that all the young men training to be physicians and surgeons could perform dissections. To meet this demand for cadavers in these medical and surgical schools, anatomy instructors had to go to extreme lengths, which meant body snatching, digging up corpses from fresh graves. It was incredible. So 
I have like a very passing knowledge of like the whole like Victorian medical stuff and just how awful it was. But yeah, I haven't known, I didn't know about this. So this is a really cool observation. And I think that does a lot to help contextualize like all of the bodies and coffins specifically around like Yosefka's clinic. So this is pretty cool. Uh, James Russell, welcome into the stream. Uh, he said, charred thermos is great. You've never heard of anything he's talked about anywhere else. And yeah, that's kind of one of the more difficult things when you're trying to analyze a game like this because it's a real balancing act between one knowing the history well enough to know where developers have drawn inspiration from and then two trying to reconcile whether or not those inspirations are supposed to be like a more of a one-to-one -one parallel within the game or whether or not it's just more like artistic liberties that were taken or just like a facelifted from other works and or whether or not the things that have been incorporated into FromSoft games came from like third-party developers because um yeah let's go ahead and pull up the one picture give me a moment here so there are some assets that get reused in FromSoft games and this is one of them well, in Bloodborne, at least, that I know came from a third-party developer because I saw, like, the website where you could, like, buy it from. So this is, like, a, a carbon copy, and this is, like, the 3D model. And as you can see, this was, like, the TurboSquid.com, I guess, is where I got it. And the person who was, like, listing it was Victor TD. And then we have another one, or maybe this is the same thing. Okay, so, no, this is a different relief, but it's the same guy. So it's very likely that FromSoft may have like used a library of external assets, which is uh, which is just a real pain in the ass in trying to determine how significant some of these uh, discoveries are. But nonetheless, uh, so far, I, I don't really think like this video is having that issue of like looking into it the wrong way. I, I mean, these are very uh, apt parallels between like the grave robbing in Victorian London and all of the coffins and the medical procedures or equipment found in uh, Yosefka's clinic. It's really common for anatomy instructors to conscript their students or assistants into this grisly service as part of their enrollment in these sought after medical programs. But surgeons would often keep a few men or even a gang of body snatchers on retainer who were known as resurrection men or sack em up men. The process of body snatching was fairly straightforward. After digging a shaft in the dirt, resurrection men would break open one end of the coffin, remove the body, stuff it into a bag, and take it under the cover of darkness to a grateful surgeon or anatomy instructor who would pay them handsomely for their ghoulish goods. It sounds almost verbatim equivalent to the snatchers that you'd find bringing people to Yahargul. This practice was routine for about 150 years. And of course, Mortis just says that right as I'm saying it too. Years. In earlier episodes, we've discussed how the uniform-clad students of the School of Mensis are portrayals of the anatomy students of the 1800s who would be draped in darkly colored gowns while performing dissections. Exceptionally important for our discussion today, there are two groups in Bloodborne that are responsible for obtaining bodies for the students of the School of Mensis. The first are the kidnapper enemies, who deliver freshly killed human subjects in a bag to the Hypogean jail. These figures are just like the body snatchers and burkers who delivered bodies in bags to anatomy schools. The others are the Yahargul hunters, who are described in their attire set as kidnappers who wear this attire to quote, blend into the night. These kidnapper figures who blend into the night are just like the real-life body snatchers who dug up graves under the cover of night and delivered the corpses in cloth or burlap bags to surgeons at anatomy schools, just like the School of Mensis or the College of Bergenworth. The Yahargul hunters are described as, quote, hunters in name only, who answered to the village's founders, the School of Mensis. Just like the hired goons who dug up bodies for early surgeons and anatomists, the Yahargul hunters work on behalf of these scholarly figures of Mensis. It's a one-to-one -one parallel. I wonder how common this is, because it would almost seem a lot smarter to just get in cahoots with whoever ran the graveyards, so you didn't necessarily... Well, I guess they probably need to avoid 
the families noticed. Never mind. Yeah, that's probably it. So they probably did work together and they just wanted to not make families aware that the remains of their family were, were being like disturbed, I guess. Anyway. It's crucial to recap these findings because the Grave Guard set employs some of the same elements while taking us a couple of steps further. We can reveal these details with a close inspection of the attire artwork, followed by a reading of the item descriptions. Let's start with the visual attributes first. Understandably, the most striking feature of Dorez's design is his mask. But this is the spooky, shiny object to distract us from the information-rich details everywhere else in his attire. Let's focus instead on the Graveguard robe. Here, we can spot an accessory shared with the Yahargul hunters, a length of rope wrapped around the torso and hanging off the side at the waist. There's a reason why both Dorez and the Yahargul hunters have this on their clothing. Rope was essential in the body snatching business. You'd need it in some cases to pull up a coffin that had been buried more than just a few feet underground. But body snatchers commonly would loop a rope around the body to drag it out of the coffin, just like the rope we see looped around the torso of these two attire sets. This is the first of several pieces of information that link Dorez to body snatching and anatomical dissection. I realize that might seem like a stretch right now, but as we continue... I don't necessarily think it's a stretch right now. Oh, maybe this is more limited into the Japanese. I should have pulled up my spreadsheet before looking up this video. But if I remember correctly, it's either the Madaris twin set or something along those lines. Oh, no, we have the dissectors, the Healing Church dissectors. But for some reason, I think they're just called executioners in like the English name for the art book. Um, but hold on, I guess, I'm pretty sure I have a picture of that, like, all tempered up. Okay, I do. Yeah, so these dudes are called executioners according to the artwork book, but this right here, uh, is, like, a dissector. So this is, like, the Japanese characters, and, like, this one over here means person, and kaitai is it says right here it means to demolish to take down or to dismantle so if you take that idea of dismantling a body I, that's why i would say a uh, dissector and just to give like a contrasting point the way that the japanese handles executioner in the other stuff like related to alfred and like the gloves is a shoke so shoke don all that so uh, it's a little bit unfortunate that these dudes were called executioners when their job was to apparently go around either killing people and or dissecting them. And uh, this isn't entirely relevant, but my headcanon for these dudes are that they're pretty much just like the brick trolls, just maybe a little bit more... Um, sane? I, maybe not sane is the right word, but just have, have a little bit more mental acuity since they can like use an axe. Well, I guess like the brick trolls can use the statues, so they're not the only ones who wielded weapons. And then I do think there was like the Moderus set, and I want to double check that real quick. And the Grave Guard set is a bit different in Japanese, uh, but I'm not entirely sure how relevant that's going to be um, as we go through the video. So I'll just kind of hold off until we uh, until it comes up a bit more naturally. So. Let's pull this up, do this. Oh, I guess that doesn't really make it bigger. So, okay, the butcher set is called more like the dissection mask. Let's see if Haruki had anything about this. No, he didn't get to it. That's unfortunate. So, yeah. Um, oh, yeah, this one's kind of messed up too, isn't it? Wait, didn't it say? Or is it the... Okay. Okay, both the twins became hunters and brought back and dissected their beast prey in order to support the villagers in their forbidden research. So this, of course, Chard Thermos is talking about like dissecting corpses, and this is slightly different, but at the very least, we do know um, there was some dissection going on, at least in the English description for this, and the stuff about the fake executioners is uh, a little bit unfortunate there. All right, but going back to chat real quick. Oops. 
Uh, Mr. Mustache says, you think it makes sense they changed the names to really differentiate from the inspiration behind the game versus the story they were trying to tell? You'd say that Executioners makes more sense. I would disagree with that. Uh, there's a lot of parallels between that and Mary Shelley's Frankenstein. And fun fact, Lovecraft was quite inspired in by, by her. Yeah, Frankenstein is a fantastic novel. Um, I was fortunate enough to be forced to read it in high school. And I was just kind of uh, really surprised at how accessible it was. I was afraid like a book from the 1800s was going to be very dry and boring. But no, it was, I mean... Of course, like the writing style is a little bit different back then, but it really wasn't that bad. And it was a lot, lot more philosophical than I was expecting at the time. Hey, Jay Dixon, welcome in. We were watching uh, Chard Thermos's video about what really happened to Lawrence. All right, here you go. You'll realize it's not a stretch in the slightest. The artwork for the Graveguard mask and robe give us yet another valuable piece of information that's incredibly easy to overlook. These attire pieces, as we can see here, aren't made of cloth. They're made of burlap, just like the bags that Bloodborne's kidnapper enemies use to bring our body to Yara Ghoul. More importantly, it's just like... All right, time to do a go Google search because I don't exactly know what burlap is. And how is that different from cloth? Like, obviously, it's kind of like the old-timey cloth. I just didn't know it was called that specifically. Because, I mean, that that looks kind of similar. Maybe this is just a uh, kind of a relevant thing or like a square and a rectangle type thing. Just a little bit curious. It's a rough cloth that Bethesda can't get. It's, it's thicker like canvas. Okay, that's kind of what I guessed, but, you know... It's, it's also nice to have like a little bit more explicit confirmation for future reference. Yeah, I, I kind of figured it was more like a potato bag. I just didn't know there was like an actual term for it. I mean, I figured there was, but how often do you guys talk about burlap in your everyday life? Like the bags that the real life resurrection men would have used to transport bodies to anatomists. Let's return to the graveguard mask for a minute. In addition to the ghostly face, the unusual shape of this mask gives it an occult, ritualistic aesthetic. But the pointy edges that poke out on the sides of the Graveguard mask have always seemed strange to me. Then I realized why- Alright, last time I'm gonna like abruptly pause it for a little bit, but um, honestly I never noticed this before, but does this kind of look like the giant dad home to anybody else from Dark Souls 1? Uh, that's just kind of me thinking of that right now. Anyway, why they look like this. The Graveguard mask is a burlap sack. The pointy edge that we see on our left is the bottom corner of the bag. The stitching in the middle of the mask is just like you'd use to sew up the sides of the burlap sack. Suddenly, the ghostly face of the Graveguard mask makes much more sense. With rope tied around the body and a burlap sack thrown over its head, Dora's is supposed to look like a dead body being pulled from a grave. So, with a quick inspection, we've already discovered two game-changing details about Dora's, but we're just getting started. The item description for the Graveguard Kilt and the Graveguard Manchettes contains a sentence that the other items in the attire set don't have. These articles of clothing are, quote, covered in the blood of untidy rituals. If you recall from the final episode of my Agony of Effort series, I put forth a good bit of evidence that Bloodborne's rituals are code for anatomical dissection. It's one of the main takeaways of the series, and one that I knew would be hard for many players to accept. I won't regurgitate the entire segment from that episode, but I noted that many of the ritual materials of Bloodborne are labeled in their item descriptions as body parts. More importantly, Several of these ritual materials are body parts displayed in glass containers filled with fluid, just like the diseased tissues and internal organs that real-life anatomists of the 17 and 1800s would have removed from cadavers during dissection and then preserved in jars filled with alcohol solutions. All right, I think that's an interesting point. I'm not entirely on board with the dissection equals ritual aspect quite yet. However, I will say like, Part of my headcanon for the way 
that ritual materials gain significance is because like blood is kind of related to all of them. Uh, like bone, apparently like blood is produced in bone marrow amongst other things. I'm not like a biologist. So if anybody has more info, feel free to share. Um, so that's kind of like one of the big ingredients also like blood in eyeballs and, uh, livers and all this other stuff I think is fairly straightforward. So I think all of these ritual materials do kind of get related to blood as well, but that's not to like diminish their significance as like specific organs or having a, a special significance themselves though. Blood is produced via, via marrow. Thank you. Also, welcome back to the stream team Sith and metallic gnome. The Graveguard Kilt and Manchettes are telling us that the game's rituals are bloody and untidy, much like the process of dissecting a corpse would be. But the Graveguard robe is the linchpin of this metaphor. Its description states, Countless bloodied ritual tools hang from its back, meaning the back of the robe. Even not knowing what these tools are, this description tells us that these rituals aren't just bloody ordeals. They require certain tools for the job. When we look at the attire artwork again, we're able to see these ritual tools that are referenced in the robe's description. The largest and most recognizable ritual tool on the back of the Graveguard robe is a bone saw. These were... So just to like back up slightly, I think maybe he might be mostly right about the idea of calling like some of the uh, organs and whatnot rituals or like part but maybe it's not exactly the dissection part because i think these materials are used in chalice rituals specifically i think that's kind of where the idea of the rituals come from so maybe they were dissecting bodies to get ingredients for chalice rituals or whatnot that would be kind of my head canon right now and you know he might still continue to change my mind as we go along here David Mitchell, welcome back. You said using organs for rituals also has real world origins too. So you think there's a bit of something there. Haru spicy? Har Haruspiki? <laughs> Is the discipline of divination through entrails. I'm going to copy this if I can. Come on, YouTube. This is the worst. So I can like look into that later perhaps because I've never heard that at all. Studying divination by the use of animal entrails, usually victims of sacrifice. Okay, cool. That sounds very interesting. Katie says, a lot of Lovecraft's works have touched upon the development of science and Frankenstein was all about that. Although Lovecraft made stories about it more because he was afraid of everything and stuff. Yeah. Okay. So I'm going back to this. Commonly used in amputations as we discussed in Bite-Sized Bloodborne number three but they were a traditional tool in the dissection kits of the 17 and 1800s. The other instruments here are a little harder to identify, so let's go left to right. First, we have a metal tool that looks incredibly similar to bone forceps found in U.S. Civil War medical kits of the mid-1800s. Bone forceps also would have been used in dissections of the 1800s and are still in use for dissections today. Next, we have a retractor, perhaps what's known as a deaver retractor. This would be used to pull back the openings of a large, deep incision in the chest or abdomen. The pair of hooked instruments to the right are also antique retractors used in surgery and dissection. And lastly, we have what appears to be either a probe or a pinfield dissector tool. The ritual tools of the Graveguard are tools that real-life anatomists would have used to dissect bodies in the 17 and 1800s. You might be wondering, what about the big hook and the hand axe that we see here? Are those dissection tools? No, they're not. But in terms of the hook, I think it's like the burlap bag and the rope on the torso of the Graveguard robe. It's a tool for body snatching. An 1896 article in the leading British medical journal, The Lancet, describes the use of large hooks in the body snatching business. After resurrection men dug a shaft, quote, the coffin was lugged up by hooks to the surface, or preferably, the end of the coffin was wrenched off with hooks while still in the shelter of the tunnel. As for the hand axe, I'm not sure. 
axes really weren't used in surgery or dissection because they were inaccurate and didn't produce the clean cuts of saws or incision knives. Axes also weren't used to open coffins in the act of body snatching. As medical researcher Frederick Waite noted in a historical review of body snatching in the 1800s, use of an axe or hatchet made too much noise for safety. A hook, crowbar, or auger would have been the tool of choice because it would allow body snatchers to break open the coffin much more quietly and not arouse suspicion. Continuing our examination of the graveguard attire, on the front side of the robe we find a satchel containing what might be another bone saw and the handles of large forceps. We don't get a full view of these tools, so it's hard to say precisely what they are. But the concept art for the graveguard attire shows a bone saw and what might be two blades of surgical scissors that have been separated. To summarize what we've revealed so far, we've seen that the graveguard Dores went into the Tomb of the Gods alongside the man who would become the gatekeeper of Bergenworth. Dores' attire is equipped with tools for bloody, untidy rituals. And the instruments that were used in these rituals were the tools that body snatchers would have used to obtain corpses, and that anatomists would have used to dissect them. If we're supposed to apply these details to Bloodborne's narrative, then seemingly every bit of information we can obtain about Dora's indicates that he was a body snatcher who engaged in, or assisted with, anatomical dissection. This is critical. Dissection is a popular theme in Bloodborne, and especially for the figures of the Forbidden Woods, which include the Madaris twins. As we can observe if we summon him or if we kill Valter, the younger Madaris twin is dressed in the Butcher attire set. We learn from its attire description that, somewhat like Dores, the Madaris twins were denizens of the Forbidden Woods. And just like Dores' graveguard attire, the butcher set worn by the Madaris twins contains a bevy of references to anatomical dissection, both in its artwork and in its text. As I pointed out in part 5 of my Agony of Effort series, the item descriptions for the butcher attire tell us that the twins dissected their beast prey to support the villagers in their forbidden research. Obviously, we see the word dissected in the English and Japanese text. But beyond that, the visuals of the set are indicative of dissection. The butcher garb contains a sullied apron, much like those worn by early anatomists, while the butcher mask is modeled upon a medieval executioner's hood. The younger Madaris twin also carries the hunter's axe, which is wielded, according to its item description, by those who wish to play the part of the executioner. This is I think that was a little bit different in Japanese. I, it's been a long time since I looked at that one specifically. Did I close my spreadsheet? Why would I do that? Uh, or maybe I just... No, I guess I did. Okay. Give me one second here. Oh, it's because I had it on the other screen. That's why, of course. So, Executioner Axe. That'd be a right-hand weapon. Or no, Hunter Axe, rather. Okay, no, it says that certain hunters are said to be fond of using axis as a means of execution. So th there's just a very slight flavor difference, but very like similar overall, just, you know. Okay, anyway, didn't mean to uh, get too distracted by that. But yeah, no, a lot of these observations I think are very solid, and I'm curious about Chard Thermos's background. Does he talk about that in any of his videos? Does anyone know? Uh, Taylor Voss Paris, welcome into the stream. He said... Crunchy has a phenomenal take. You greatly enjoy his content. Well, that's good because we will be watching one of Crunchy's videos uh, in the stream very uh, towards the end. All right, going back to the video real quick. This isn't a coincidence. In Great Britain, the bodies of executed criminals were the primary source of cadavers that anatomists were allowed to dissect in the mid to late 18th century, following the implementation of the Murder Act of 1752. The prey, if you will, of real-life executioners were convicted criminals who would be hanged and then dissected for medical research. The forbidden research of the Forbidden Woods seems to be a reference to anatomical dissection, which also might shade how we interpret the Forbidden Grave. As a final point on the butcher attire, Last protagonist notes in his Japanese retranslations that the name for this attire in its original Japanese isn't the butcher set, 
It's the dissection set. Hey, I know he that guy. He even notes that the Japanese word in the title of this attire set, quote, literally means to separate viscera and is more commonly taken as autopsy or dissect. There's a common theme here in the Forbidden Woods, as we can see. Thus far, Dores fits perfectly into Bloodborne's central medical metaphor, which primarily focuses on body snatching and anatomical dissection. But there's one more thing I think we have to consider. And if you'll forgive Oh yeah, I guess I should plug the spreadsheet in case anybody else wants to look at it. <laughs> so yeah, here is the link to my spreadsheet if anybody is curious about some of those details. I do not have it in the video description right now, but it is in my channel description, so it should be accessible there. Also, if you just type in like Bloodborne Japanese retranslation into Google, that should be good enough to pull it up for you guys. All right. Forgive the grandiosity of the statement. I think it's a revolutionary idea that upends our long held notions of the game's plot while solidifying my argument for Bloodborne's hidden meaning. When we speak with Alfred in Cathedral Ward, he gives us a brief history of the College of Bergenworth. As we've discussed, Bergenworth can only be accessed through the Forbidden Woods and is immediately adjacent to the Forbidden Grave. Alfred tells us, once a group of young Bergenworth scholars discovered a holy medium deep within the tomb, referring to the Tomb of the Gods or the Labyrinth. Alfred goes on to say that the discovery of this holy medium, quote, led to the founding of the healing church and the establishment of blood healing. Within the lore community, the term holy medium has often been interpreted as a substance, such as the old blood, a great one, or some other remnant of the great ones. It's also often assumed that these young Bergenworth scholars that Alfred mentions included Lawrence and possibly even German and Maria. But there's no information in the game that directly or even really indirectly links these named characters to this group from Bergenworth that went into the tomb. Additionally, there's no direct evidence that the holy medium they found was the old blood or something related to the Great Ones. So who exactly were these young Bergenworth scholars, and what exactly was this holy medium that they discovered? I think we have the answers to these two questions. Let's focus first on what the scholars discovered. For that question, we need to turn to the Japanese text. Arukimanya has released dozens of videos over the last five years examining the game's original Japanese and comparing it with Bloodborne's official English text. I've previously cited his work from his Translation Born series. In one of his videos from 2017, which I've linked in the description, he points out that while the English version uses the term holy medium to describe whatever it was that the Bergenworth scholars discovered in and retrieved from the Tomb of the Gods, the original Japanese uses the term seitai, which can be interpreted in a couple of ways. The most common translation for seitai is Eucharist, meaning the bread and wine that Christians consume during communion. This translation certainly gives a divine or godly aura to whatever was found in the Tomb of the Gods, and that's important, as we'll find out. But Seitai can also mean simply holy body, which can be interpreted in a much more literal sense. The term is used to describe the physical body of Christ, or the bodies of emperors, who in Japan are believed to be of a divine bloodline. This opens up the possibility that Bergenworth scholars didn't just bring back some divine substance, they delved into the tomb and brought back a dead body. Alfred also tells us that this holy medium or holy body is venerated in the main cathedral. As we know, the thing that's venerated in the main cathedral is the beastly skull of Lawrence. This is why Last Protagonist has suggested that the holy medium was the body or skull of Lawrence. That obviously sounds... That's sort of correct, but that doesn't have like the full context. I mean, the real reason I'm saying that with a more confidence than just like the text would allow would just come from the interview that Miyazaki did. So let me pull that up. Okay. So, the scene after you defeat Amelia also leaves a lot to the imagination. 
Miyazaki says, That's meant to give you a look into the memory of Lawrence, who appears in the cutscene as well. His skull served as the start of the healing church itself, but it's taken the form of a twisted beast. There's a lot you can imagine from that. So yeah. Um, but even without this quote, I still would have made this argument that I think Lawrence is very obviously supposed to be a kind of um, stand-in for the Jesus or Christ-like fi figure in this universe. And because of that, the whole uh, Seitai being a word that can be used for Eucharist, I think just kind of works on multiple levels. And it's understandable that the localization team wouldn't have said like, or Alfred wouldn't have said like, oh, the Eucharist is venerated in like the main cathedral, whatever it was, because like that has a very specific connotation in English. But at least the Japanese can work on multiple levels to evoke that imagery, but not necessarily always have to mean it that way, if that makes sense. It's always fun watching a bunch of people come to the same conclusion independently. Yeah. So, uh, cool stuff. Strange and runs counter to the popular sentiment in the lore community. But it's hard to argue with the text-based evidence. And after what I'm about to show you, I'm confident you'll agree that this is the correct interpretation. Wait, wait, wait. He just said I'm right? All right, uh, hold on, guys. We need to go ahead and like this video. No, I'm just, I'm just playing. Lawrence, as we know, underwent some sort of beastly transformation and became the first cleric beast. Because Lawrence was somehow associated with the establishment of blood healing, a practice that ends up transforming a large number of humans into beasts, there are certainly many correlations with Robert Louis Stevenson's story Strange Case of Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde, as I've previously discussed. I had assumed that this was the main inspiration for Lawrence, and that his name was also derived from sources associated with the anesthesia-like healing blood that became Lawrence's long-term legacy. While I don't reject my earlier conclusions about the influential role of Jekyll and Hyde on Bloodborne's beastly transformation and the healing blood, I now know that my conclusions about Lawrence's naming origins were completely and utterly wrong. Please allow me to correct the record with this bit of history. In the late 1750s, an Irish-born clergyman suffering from pulmonary tuberculosis and a troubled marriage found a new calling. From his home in Sutton-on-the-Forest, a tiny village near York in the far north of England, he wrote and self-published a series of comic novels that almost overnight made him a celebrity in London and a star in the literary circles of England and France. The novels, The Life and Opinions of Tristram Shandy Gentleman, were of a satirical styling that was both endearing and somewhat controversial at the time. But at least for our purposes, it isn't so much the literary works of this man that connect him to Bloodborne. Instead, it's the details of his life, and more importantly, his death. Lawrence Stern became Vicar of Sutton on the Forest in the late 1730s, and performed vicary duties for nearby Stillington as well. It was after 20 years in the clergy, and only after advancing into his mid-40s, that Stern tried his hand at writing, becoming an almost instant success. Unfortunately for Lawrence Stern and his readers, his tuberculosis worsened rapidly in 1768, shortly after Stern published what would be his final work, A Sentimental Journey. He died in March of that year, and despite his modest fame, was buried in a pauper's graveyard in Hanover Square in London. That's when matters turned to the macabre. Two days after Stern's burial, body snatchers dug up his corpse, transported it almost 60 miles north, and sold it to anatomists at the medical college at Cambridge. There, Stern's remains were dissected by professor of anatomy Charles Collignon. Although there are differing accounts of the events that day, Someone in the audience recognized that the body on the dissecting table was that of known author Lawrence Stern. It wasn't enough to stop the dissection and the accompanying lecture, but it certainly changed the destination of Stern's remains after the procedure was completed. Typically, dissected bodies, or the miscellaneous pieces of it, would be buried unceremoniously near anatomy schools, prisons, or workhouses, or they could just be cremated. But that's not what happened with Stern's remains. 
According to biological archaeologists Jenna Dittmar and Piers Mitchell, it's believed that a student or a faculty member retrieved Stern's remains after the dissection and returned them to London for burial. Believe it or not, we haven't reached the strangest part of this story. I think the amateur historians from the blog The London Dead captured it best in their entry on the strange saga of Lawrence Stern. Following the dissection, quote, Stern's corpse was discreetly returned to St. George's Field, Sands Head, according to some who reckoned that Dr. John Parsons or Dr. Collignon hung on to the skull as a souvenir. It's believed that Charles Collignon, the anatomy professor who performed the dissection, wanted Stern's skull as a part of an anatomy collection that he would go on to amass over the years. It was the first collection of its kind at Cambridge, and many of its preparations remain at the medical college today as part of the Duckworth Collection. More than 250 years after the dissection of Lawrence Stern, no one can say for certain whether his skull is one of the hundreds at Cambridge, as many researchers insist, or whether it indeed was returned to St. George's Field in London all those years ago. Many of the graves at the old cemetery were relocated in the 1960s to make way for a commercial development. The Lawrence Stern Trust and its curator, Kenneth Monkman, hoped to help facilitate the transfer and reinterment of Stern's remains, and they received permission to search for his remains at the grave marked by his headstone. To their bewilderment, they found several skulls in and around the grave, including one whose cranium had been sawn completely off a telltale sign of dissection. In short, Lawrence Stern died and his body was removed from its grave and dissected. His head was removed, and it's possible that its cranium was sawn completely off. And more than two centuries later, no one really has a clue what happened to the missing skull of Vicar Lawrence. The similarities between the 18th century author, Lawrence Stern, and the former... Was... was... Lawrence Stern, a vicar? That was just kind of a little bit of a jump. I don't. Did he mention that before? No one really has a clue what happened to the missing skull of Vicar Lawrence. The similarities between the. dissected. His head was removed, and it's possible that its cranium was sawn completely okay. off. He said he was clergy. And more okay. than two centuries later, no one really has a clue what happened to the missing skull of Vicar Lawrence. The well, even if he was clergy, that doesn't necessarily mean he was a vicar, right? Just, uh, I mean, not like de denying what he's saying here. I'm just saying like, uh, that could have been set up a little bit more, I guess. The similarities between the 18th century author, Lawrence Stern, oh, he did. Okay, and the former scholar of Bergenworth, Lawrence, are hard to ignore. They share the same name with the same spelling. They share the same vicar title. Their heads were somehow removed after death so they could be kept on display. And there's a strong implication in the item, Lawrence's skull, that his skull is lost and can't be found. These similarities also strongly indicate to us that just like the body of Lawrence Stern, the body of Lawrence, the first vicar, might have also been removed from the grave and dissected. This is what Alfred was telling us. This holy medium or holy body that was found in the tomb of the gods and brought back was the body of Lawrence. This body, or at least what remains of it, is what is venerated in the Grand Cathedral. Lawrence, according to what Alfred is telling us, is the origin of the healing blood. It wasn't Queen Yarnum, it wasn't Abritus, it was Lawrence. The body of Lawrence being this holy entity also makes the other translation of Setai seem completely appropriate. As we discussed earlier, Setai is most commonly translated as Eucharist, the bread and wine symbolizing the body and blood of Christ that are consumed in the religious ceremony of communion. By consuming this symbol of dead but divine flesh and blood, Christians make spiritual contact with Christ. Compare that with Lawrence, whose bodily remains are found in a religious sanctuary, the Grand Cathedral. He's considered a messianic figure within the Healing Church, a quasi-religious organization led by clerics and nuns. 
Body snatchers were called resurrection men because they brought bodies out of the grave, just like in Christian theology, Jesus rose from the dead and disappeared from his tomb. Lawrence being resurrected, so to speak, is yet another Christ-like quality that From Software seems to be leaning into by playing on the literal and lingual symbols of body snatching. Whereas Christ resurrected, Lawrence was resurrected. We've answered the question, what was the holy medium or holy body that this group of Bergenworth scholars discovered in the Tomb of the Gods? It was Lawrence. But we still haven't answered the question, who... I would disagree with that for a variety of reasons. So I, I wasn't sure if he was making that point explicitly up until this point, or if he was just like building up to it like a, a grander reveal. I thought originally he was going to say like, Lawrence is the holy body as far as the healing church is concerned, but then the question becomes, uh, where did Lawrence get his blood, essentially? So I think to just like back up to the cutscene with Lawrence and Willem, it doesn't make much sense for Bergenworth to have found Lawrence's body in the tombs for Lawrence to then like break off from Willem and then do his own thing. Like, why would Lawrence be told to be afraid of the old blood if he is the old blood, I guess, is kind of what I'm saying. So in my mind, and maybe I'm just kind of misinterpreting Chard Thermos here, and you might like rephrase things in a different way in a moment here. In my mind, Lawrence and the Bergenworth fellows were studying the things underground, and Lawrence took the blood and literally partook in it, and that caused him to eventually transform. But... Before he transformed, he also disseminated his blood that had been tainted by the blood underground, the old blood, to the followers of the healing church. So with him being like the quote unquote founding member of the healing church, he is the, the source of the healing church's blood because he was the first purveyor of blood ministration. That's my kind of understanding of events here. Uh, Katie said this reminded them of something they've heard. Apparently there is or was some bad blood between the Native Americans and anthropologists because some of bad history that had to do with stealing remains. Uh, yeah, that wouldn't surprise me. It was a long time ago since you've looked into it. Okay. It's certainly an understatement. Desecrating holy land of indigenous people more like. That's true. And we have the very American trope of like burying or like building something on an Indian burial ground. But uh, anyway, going back to the video, he might rephrase things here. I'm afraid that he doesn't. So let's see where it goes from here. Who were the Bergenworth scholars that made this discovery? I don't think we can answer this question with absolute certainty, but I think we could come very close. If Lawrence was the holy medium that was found in the tomb, then clearly Lawrence wasn't part of this group of scholars that made this discovery. So who were they? I think it might have been Doris and the Gatekeeper. That might sound ludicrous at first, but let me show you several things and have you look at some well-known features in the game with a completely different perspective. I'd ask you to hold your judgment until then. We know for certain that Master Willem, the head scholar at Bergenworth, sent or even accompanied a small group of his servants into the labyrinth. The Japanese text leaves open the possibility that he led this group into the tomb. These servants were Dores and the man who would become the gatekeeper. As we've already shown in great detail, everything about Dores is associated with body snatching and dissection. It therefore seems a very safe bet that Willem sending or accompanying Dores into a tomb was for a very specific purpose, to snatch a body for dissection. This tandem of Dores and the future gatekeeper could have been merely servants, much like the hired body snatchers that surgeons or anatomy instructors of the 18th and 19th centuries often relied upon. But as I mentioned before, it wasn't at all uncommon for medical colleges and anatomy schools to push the burden of obtaining bodies onto the medical students. A fictional but still accurate depiction of this very thing is the plot of R.L. Stevenson's short story The Body Snatcher. 
Two of the senior medical students in this 1884 story are tasked with obtaining bodies at the insistence of their headmaster, who is referred to only as Mr. K. The work takes them by night to remote graveyards in the countryside near Edinburgh, where they dig up what they believe is a farmer's wife and start to bring it back to the medical school in their horse-drawn carriage. Although they're called servants in the graveyard attire, could Dores and the gatekeeper have been scholars of Bergenworth following the orders of their headmaster? Removing Lawrence's body from the tomb is one thing. Dissecting it is another. How do we know that Lawrence's body was dissected? Because the game tells us so. The surgery altar in The Hunter's Nightmare, as I said in part 14 of my Agony of Effort series, is a monument to the art of dissection. That's not hard to figure out. But there's a very important detail that takes on a new and exceptional significance after what we've discovered about the real-life influence for Lawrence. The dissected corpse on the table is missing the top of its skull. I previously thought that the surgery altar was just a scene or symbol to underscore the importance of anatomical dissection to Bloodborne's story and underlying metaphor. But after further review, I don't think that's true. I think this sculpture captures a moment in time in the Bloodborne story. It depicts the dissection of the body of Lawrence. As we noted about the corpse of Lawrence Stern, his head was removed in a dissection, and quite possibly the top of the cranium was sawn off. This is identical to the body on the table of the surgery altar. In order to activate the elevator for the surgery altar, we have to obtain an item called the eye pendant, which we find resting in the hand of Lawrence, the first vicar, in his cleric beast form in the other Nightmare Cathedral. We have to bring it back and place it in the skull of a dissected body on the surgery altar. This directly links Lawrence, in his cleric beast form, to the dissected body on the table. When we use the elevator device, the platform directly below the surgery altar shows the waking world altar of the Grand Cathedral, upon which Lawrence's beastly skull resides. We're supposed to associate Lawrence's skull with his dissection. It's crucial to note that the device used to activate the elevator is the eye pendant. Its description tells us that we need to grant eyes to the surgery altar skull. This is the same phrase that Mikolash uses in his famous line, grant us eyes, grant us eyes, plant eyes on our brains to cleanse our beastly idiocy. By putting eyes on this corpse's brain, by granting it eyes, we're putting an eye into the cavity of a dissected body. This is exactly what I meant when I said earlier in this series that the term eyes on the inside means a surgeon's or anatomist's ability to literally see inside the human body during a surgical operation or dissection. But that's not all. There's another major piece of this puzzle I think we've completely misinterpreted. Once we obtain the item Lawrence's skull from the lower level of the surgery altar, we can return to the Nightmare Cathedral and use it to revive Lawrence. When we do, he returns to life and we see him close the hand that was previously holding the eye pendant, as if he recognizes that it's been removed. It was. We placed it in the skull of the dissected body on the surgery altar. He then places his other hand not on his eyes, but on the top of his head. This is the moment that Lawrence realizes that his head was removed, or dissected. He's now aware that hunters took his remains from his grave and dissected them. He's not overcome with guilt from his own actions. He's outraged at what others did to his body. Much like I had assumed the surgery altar was just a signal to... Uh, that interpretation kind of reminds me of the Manus stuff from Dark Souls 1. I have a couple issues with some of the other things that he said, but I want him to finish his points. I just uh, wanted to bring up that uh, scene just to kind of keep in everyone else's minds. Emphasize the concept of dissection. I thought the same thing about the unique posture of Lawrence's burning cleric beast body in the Nightmare Cathedral. Here again, I was wrong. As I've pointed out many times, Lawrence's corpse is positioned to look exactly like from nature, 
a plaster cast of a dissected body by Scottish surgeon and anatomist John Goodsir made in 1845. This isn't an accident. It's a deliberate design choice to scream to us that Lawrence was dissected. It also has the side benefit of conveying the symbol of Christ from Michelangelo's Pieta, which was... Yeah, I was just about to bring this up. So wouldn't this have predated the other sculpture? Would the other sculpture have been inspired by this or the idea of this? I think that might need clarification. Also the inspiration to good sirs from nature. Okay. That's not all that the surgery altar shows us. There are three figures surrounding the body. As many have long assumed, the figure leading this dissection ritual appears to be a young Master Willem, who's wearing a distinctive hat similar to the one we see him wearing on the balcony overlooking the Moonside Lake. He's accompanied by two assistants. Not one, not three, two. The same number of servants he sent into the labyrinth. Maybe this is Doris and the gatekeeper. There's not enough information to make that conclusion with complete confidence, but there are a few things worth noting. We know from the Graveguard attire descriptions that these two characters went mad after going into the Tomb of the Gods and coming into contact with the Eldritch Truth, which means some sort of arcane knowledge. The concept of madness is almost omnipresent in Bloodborne, but there's something that connects madness almost across the board. Madness is the result of people coming into contact with the arcane, meaning the unknown internal features of the human body. People who come into contact with dead bodies in the tombs or engage in dissection rituals afterward lose their minds. For just a few examples, the ritual of Mensis, which I've argued is a reference to anatomical dissection, is performed by, quote, madmen who toil surreptitiously. The player character gains arcane knowledge by consuming the contents of a dead man's skull, receiving Madman's knowledge. The Madman's attire set is worn by healing church tomb prospectors who, quote, can't withstand the weight of the old knowledge. Those who, quote, delve into the arcane fall all too easily into madness, so they must take sedative, a liquid medicine developed at Bergenworth. Lastly, the bell-ringing woman appears to be a mad Thumerian, having come into contact with the cosmos. These women ring their bells and bring enemies back to life. They resurrect the dead. One of the figures in the surgery altar is holding a bell over the corpse of Lawrence. Like the mad bell-ringing women, these chime maidens, they're figuratively resurrecting Lawrence, to use the parlance of 18th century body snatchers, or resurrection men. I anticipate many people will find it hard to accept this idea that the body on the table of the surgery altar is that of Lawrence. How could this be Lawrence when we know that his skull looked like this? To that, I would say, the game already gives us three versions of what Lawrence's skull or body could be. We have his beastly skull in the waking world. We have his cleric beast form which, as we well know, doesn't seem to accurately reflect the nature of his beastly transformation in the waking world. And finally, we have the item Lawrence's skull, which shows a fairly standard human skull many years after death. In a sense, it's almost like Miyazaki is playing upon the mystery of the skull of Lawrence Stern. In the case of Stern, there are three possible outcomes. Stern's skull might have been returned to a grave in London almost entirely intact. Alternatively, it might have been reinterred with the top of the cranium sawn off. And finally, it might still be residing in a collection at Cambridge. The ambiguity of Lawrence's skull in the game matches the uncertainty of the fate of Lawrence Stern's skull in real life. I think one reason or one thing that you would need to make that argument a bit more compelling is a justification for this skull of Lawrence to be in a nightmare. So in other words, like all of Yarnum to be in a nightmare because it doesn't have the completely broken open like cut that would be necessary for dissection perhaps. But yeah, if you do take this as the waking world, I would think that kind of pokes a big hole in the idea that uh, Lawrence's skull was dissected while he was still a human, 
but I wouldn't be surprised if the healing church scholars did like obviously like root around here because it's not like it it has like the brains and the eyes and the stuff that you would normally expect to accompany a head. So they did do something to this skull to some degree, right? But um. Anyway, I think it's kind of interesting to say that uh, you shouldn't trust the stuff in the Nightmare because you have a Cleric Beast Lawrence as well as the Skull. But I never took the representation of the human skull in the Nightmare to be something literal. I just took it to be more of a metaphor for Lawrence's lost humanity. Although I did appreciate the kind of inadvertent connection that this interpretation makes between like Lawrence and Manus losing something and wanting it back. I think that's a pretty cool argument, even if it's not something I personally agree with. And I do have a little bit more to mention, but I want to hear the rest of their thoughts. Astonex would argue that the beast skull in the waking world is what he ended up as, and the human skull would be what he wants to return to. Yeah, that's kind of what's suggested in his item description, but I don't think... The actual physical representations of both of those line up well with Chard Thermos's arguments right here that this Lawrence was dissected in the same way as Lawrence Stern was. Matches the uncertainty of the fate of Lawrence Stern's skull in real life. If you're still not sold on this idea, let's look at one final thing. Bloodborne's opening cinematic shows the hunter hacking his way through the beasts of Yarnum before abruptly changing the setting. We see the hunter emerge in a dark location carrying a torch. This place is abandoned. The candles are extinguished. There's no one here. But at last we see a familiar sight, followed by the skull of Lawrence. I had always assumed this cinematic was showing us the Grand Cathedral, but I don't think that's true. The hunters walking through narrow corridors that don't exist in the Grand Cathedral. I think this cinematic is showing us Lawrence's tomb. This is the labyrinth. This is where the scholars of Bergenworth discovered the holy body of Lawrence and brought his remains to the surface. This is the holy medium. The cathedral containing the surgery altar appears to tell the story of Lawrence in three acts. At the entrance to the cathedral, there's a monument to Lawrence, showing what is likely his recently deceased human body wrapped in a bag or perhaps a death shroud, having been removed from the grave. From there, it was taken elsewhere for further investigation, to be dissected, as we see on the surgery altar. Pres Unfortunately, like one thing which kind of doesn't go super well with the idea that it was like Lawrence down beneath the tombs is we also have another nondescript cleric beast assail us on top of the great bridge. So it isn't like the that Lawrence was the only cleric beast, unfortunately. But nonetheless, I don't think the uh, footage that was shown of the like trailer is really representative of what you would get in the final game because it, it was made so early in development. I think it makes more sense that like parts of it were meant to obviously represent the underground chalice dungeons. And then the cut you could just argue is just coming back to the actual Grand Cathedral and they should still be like separate. And just like the flow of the video itself just isn't very... I don't, I don't want to say like it's very good. I just don't think it's like super consistent with what you get in the actual final build of the game. But um, I'm a little bit surprised he hasn't brought up the idea of Lawrence being the bloodletting beast because that was a very popular and I guess it is still a very popular idea which would give a lot more credence to his suggestions that Lawrence could have been the original source of the old blood. But I'm very surprised that he doesn't like tie it into the bloodletting beast whose name is kind of like the founder beast in the titles or um or not titles but the uh, internal names and something else but uh host of the beast blood is kind of one way you could also look at his name in japanese in the retail build kind of like the same way that mikalash is the host of the nightmare that's kind of what the bloodletting beast is host of beast blood 
All right, and then he has a little bit more here, and then I'll go back into some other of my thoughts. Presumably, years later, Lawrence's skull, removed long ago, becomes the holy medium upon which the healing church was founded, as we see on the lower level of the surgery altar. Lawrence's story has been in front of our eyes the whole time, and it's far more detailed and unexpected than we could have imagined. We just needed the medical metaphor to see it. Thanks for watching. All right, that was a Bloodborne lore extra, What Really Happened to Lawrence by Chard Thermos. I do think that was a very interesting video. I really appreciated a lot of the insights into like the medical uh, time of like Victorian London, especially with relation to like the body snatchers. Um, I will say like, I think the claims at the beginning of the video were a bit grandiose, but I mean, that's really just kind of like a part of showmanship. One that I don't personally like partake in too much myself. But uh, the few things that I did want to mention in reply to the video and the idea that like Lawrence was the origin of the blood, I think that gets contradicted in a couple different places. And I mentioned earlier the idea that it doesn't make sense for Lawrence to have been dug up from the chalices if Willem is like, hey, bro don't use the old blood. You should be scared of that stuff. It seemed like Lawrence, like how, how would Willem have the, the room to uh, say that to Lawrence if that were actually the case? Um, then the other things that I did want to talk about, and I do have the notes on the bottom of my screen now um, with uh, Pepe Ofnir to the side, the things relating to the auger of Abritus and the sedatives. So I'm going to pull up my spreadsheet again real quickly here. And we'll go over to the consumables because both the auger of abritus and sedatives can be found here. So um, even in the English localization, it says that the initial encounter with the auger of abritus marked the start of an inquiry into the cosmos from within the old labyrinth and led to the establishment of the choir. So this is saying essentially that the Bergenworth scholars came into contact with this weird ass slug and they're like, what the hell is going on? There is a magic slug. Where did this thing come from? And so that's kind of what led them down into the chalices or not chalices, like literally, but the underground uh, labyrinth or whatever you want to call it. And then next we have sedatives, which says, of course, in English, it's not as clear. Oh, no, 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 not sedative. Is it sedative? No, no, it is definitely sedative. Okay, so the English localization is a bit different. So just to uh, give a big disclaimer there, those who delve into the arcane fall all too easily to madness and thick human blood serves to calm the frayed nerves of it, these inquisitive minds. Naturally, this often leads to a reliance on blood ministration. So this line right here, I would say is pretty directly wrong. And my Retranslation of that final line is that sedatives were eventually the sprout that led to blood healing. And of course, this is a literal translation, so don't like begrudge how kind of stilted it sounds to say like it's the sprout that led to blood healing. That's just kind of like literally what it's saying here, like this. And then Aruki Mania, I do know, has finished this uh, description. And he says that in time, sedatives were the germ, which is another like botanical word for sprouting it was the germ that became tied to blood healing so um in my mind coming into contact with the arcane stuff down there in the tombs started to make people go mad we're not given a direct answer what that arcane stuff is but we do have a couple um choices to go through as chard thermos said like coming into contact with dead bodies and specifically like their skulls could lead to madman's wisdom or madman's knowledge which is kind of coming into contact with the arcane that's where they gain enlightenment another possible interpretation would be related to the eye rune and this one isn't very straightforward keep in mind um 
This is a transcription of I, as spoken by the Left Behind Great Ones, allows one to make additional discoveries. I symbolize the truth Master Willem sought in his research. Disillusioned by the limits of human intellect, Master Willem looked to the beings from higher planes for guidance and sought to line his brain with eyes in order to elevate his thoughts. The important thing is... Wait, does it not say here? Oh, it's spoken by Left Behind Great Ones. Um, the... This isn't entirely wrong. The issue is in Japanese, it's not clear if something is singular or plural in a reference to like a great one or great ones. But we do have other cases of the left behind great one being an explicit reference to a brightest in things like the pearl slug and something else, which I can't think of off the top of my head. So uh, the way that I would retranslate it would be that the... I, Carol Rune, is a representation of the abandoned superior being's voice, a.k.a. the voice of Abritus, which I think kind of goes back into the whole idea of uh, Abritus and her connections to Rom, Rom being granted eyes on the inside, but that's maybe moving a bit beyond this topic right here. So even though like the Beast Rune is technically like the first Carol Rune that was discovered, I have wondered whether or not going down into the chalices and messing around with the auger of Abritus has allowed them to come into contact with the voice of Abritus. And that voice itself carries arcane power. And we can compare the idea of voices having like arcane power and leading to frenzy, which you would need a sedative for with things like the brain of Mensis, the winter lanterns and things like that. So I, I think Willem, Doris, and the Gatekeeper may have all gone down into the chalices. They may have come into contact with something, whether that's just like the random insight type effect that you get in, in meeting like a random boss down there, whether it means coming into contact with the corpses, whether it means coming into contact with the impurities and the blood itself directly, kind of how you would get insight from blood dregs, which get offered to the to, uh, Kanehurst Queen or whether it's coming into contact with the voices of great ones like Abritus. So I think there's a bunch of potential reasons why they could come into contact with the quote-unquote Eldritch Truth, which I would argue is just the arcane. And because of that, they started to take blood for whatever reason to calm their nerves. And then by them taking blood they may have inadvertently started to take corpse blood rather than relying on like people blood. And then they may have inadvertently discovered cold blood, AKA dead blood from the corpses down in the tombs, which um, is what it would eventually go on to become like the Genesis of the healing church, uh, I guess. So that's kind of where I would say like Lawrence is the holy medium which began the healing church but that isn't the whole story let's like um the old blood is like the source lawrence took the old blood and then he became like the drug dealing distributor of the old blood to people in the healing church all right so that was a lot of monologuing there you're still processing the fact that the skull in the cathedral is Lawrence's. Like, why does it look so much like Ludwig? Um, it's it's potentially because like uh, that skull in the earliest parts of development were was supposed to be more related to like the bloodletting beast, and then they just kind of changed it. But that's a pretty dissatisfactory answer. But I think it's unfortunately like the most correct one. You thought I was being fancy with the word sprout? No, I was just being literal. You want to know who or what split Lawrence's skull? That's a good question. A lot of people like to believe that it's Braidor because Braidor's set uh, talks about how he killed his compatriot and he's wearing like a cleric beast pelt. So he might have killed Lawrence in the waking world. That's one very popular theory. Um, I like the theory. I don't think there's enough to say that it's truly the case that oh, that what happened. That's what happened, but I think it's an acceptable enough headcanon that I'm not going to like really uh, give anybody uh, crap for believing it. <laughs> Lawrence was the pusher man for sure. Did I almost say two fingers there? I have no idea. 
Katie asks, would I say that the people in Yarnum become beasts because cold blood is impure? So that's a very good question. And I think it's nuanced because if that were the case, one would expect there to be a lot more bestial type enemies in Kanehurst or even in the Tumerian Chalice Dungeons. But on the contrary, if you ignore like the bosses of the Chalice Dungeons, there are no beast type normal enemies in Tumaru or in Kanehurst. So I think that there is a kind of dichotomy between wisdom and beasthood to a certain degree, but I don't think it's quite as strong as most people believe. So to re rephrase that, I would say that if you have enough insight that could potentially forestall beasthood to a certain degree and if you have enough insight to be like completely enlightened or like transcend, then you're probably not going to turn into a beast. So I do think that the people of Kanehurst are descended from Tumaru and their bodies have kind of evolved over generations to be able to tolerate a decent, a decent amount of the old blood flowing within it. And I think that's kind of like how blood, blood saints are different from normal people. They have a higher tolerance for the old blood. So when you are given that higher tolerance, it's because your body has been exposed to the arcane knowledge of the dead that persists within blood, perhaps. And normal Yarnamites have never had that experience before. So when they take the blood, they're taking in the wills of the dead. And if they take in too much of it, the Yarnamites don't have enough of their own innate willpower to kind of overpower like the ex excess wills within the blood, which will kind of like take over that person's desires and just kind of or, like take over that person's maybe m mental state, mentality, whatever you want to call it. to the point where they just kind of get into their most basic urges in wanting to live and consuming other things to keep on uh, drinking more and more blood. So that's kind of my thoughts on that. Uh, your internet cut off? Did you miss anything? Just kind of me describing why I think people transform into beasts. So you really missed a very crucial uh, reply to your like question there a moment ago. So you probably like want to back up or uh, like rewatch this later on. Uh, Stella says a bunch of opium addicts being like, what if we take blood? It's such a funny possibility for how things got so messy. And if you think about it, I mean, it makes sense because blood is considered more intoxicating than alcohol in Yarnum. Okay. Uh, Matt Thomas said, Chard Thermos did another video about Kanerst being a different branch of anesthesia, continuing the medical metaphor. Okay. We might need to uh, delve into a few more of his videos as well. So anyway... Uh, that's all I think I have to say about that for now in reply to Chard Thermos. I think it was a very interesting video. I did enjoy it. Uh, a lot of very insightful um, comparisons to like real life history. I'm very curious about his background because that's stuff that I don't have very much knowledge in directly. And it's not something that most people are going to be very knowledge about, knowledgeable about. So yeah, I enjoyed it. Okay. So now that we've watched that, we will go ahead and move into our next video. All right, so I thought this would be a good transitionary point between moving from Chard Thermos's video about uh, Bloodborne and into more Elden Ring based content with Honored Madman's Did Alexander Harvest General Radon? So, like I said earlier in the stream, I think it's a very interesting theory that I hadn't even really thought of, but it makes a lot of sense, I guess. So I'm curious as to what this all entails. So let's go ahead and dive on in. Oh wait, and I forgot. Whoops. For anybody who uh, enjoyed Chard Thermos' video, I'm gonna paste the link into chat. So go ahead and give him a Wait, did it not save? A like and a subscribe? Let me refresh just to make sure it works.
when we talk okay now we're good all right okay so now we will be moving on to did alexander harvest general radon by andred madman Alright, today we're going to be talking about one of my favorite theories in Elden Ring. Is that Radon is the red-haired champion mentioned in the Shard of Alexander. So basically, after Alexander has reached Faramazula, he'll no longer drop the generic warrior jar shard when killed, either through a duel or unprovoked. By this point, he had been on a long journey, taking part in Radon's defeat and having harvested a bit of the legendary general's remains. He will now drop the much better Shard of Alexander, which apart from visually containing a shard of Radon's armor, and likely a chunk of the great general himself, along with the accompanying text that states that they could be the remains of a red-haired champion. At the crumbling sky city of Faramazula, the warrior jar Alexander challenges you to a duel. Despite fighting bravely, he is defeated and his remains are brought to the fledgling warrior jar that survived the massacre of Jarberg, and thus both Radon and Alexander's story would continue within the young warrior jar, who would no doubt go on to become a legend on his own. Well, that's all well and good and everything, but uh, what evidence backs that up? Like, what's there to support that? And is I didn't notice that or didn't know that that apparently you get the Alexander shard after this section essentially when he moves on to the lake. I thought, and I might be misremembering what you get that you needed to complete his quest and actually like talk to him and get him to fight you properly in Fair Missoula to get the final item, but I don't remember what that was. I So maybe it has something to do with the Jar Baron, and that's not Alexander Shard. I think that's probably what it is. But yeah, I'll need to like revisit that, because that's something I didn't notice. We're going to go over that in this video. The first piece of evidence, and possibly I think is the best, is that the uh, Shard of Alexander, there's visibly a shard of what appears to be Radon's armor, and on Radon's armor that we were able to buy from Enya, it appears he's missing a chunk that's about the exact same shape and size as the one we see on the Shard of Alexander. Now this is relatively subtle, but I'm pretty sure it's intentional, and definitely a good piece of evidence that supports the theory. There's also the fact that Radon is frequently referred to as being proud of his red hair. Supports the so theory. I think he's talking about There's this here? I never that noticed that, that's really cool. referred to as being proud of his red hair, despite Radagon despising it, which he himself saw as some kind of a curse from the fell god of the giants. Curiously though, instead of being uh, fond of Radagon, Radon appeared to be a fanboy of Godfrey, which would reflect in his lion motif, even viewing himself as Godfrey's successor as the Lord of the Battlefield, which makes the fact that he got defeated by Godfrey's actual son, the fell omen, all the more devastating. No, that's not Radon. Look, there's no horns here. The dude is tiny, and there's no way that he would be considered the strongest of all the demigods if he got uh, beat by a goat boy. I will I will die on this hill disagreeing with people. Well, I suppose he wouldn't have known that Margaret was a uh, Godfrey's son, but still, definitely interesting to me. Some have alleged that the red-haired champion mentioned in the description could possibly refer to the fire giant that both Alexander and the main character are able to defeat before entering Faramazula. And the giant himself could be considered a champion of the fell god. It's definitely a possibility, although there isn't much other evidence besides the fact that we know Alexander fought him but we never saw Alexander harvesting or anywhere in the actual mountaintops of giants. We only see him as a spirit. So it could be safely assumed that he did possibly harvest some of the fire giant, but we don't literally see him harvesting like we do at Verdon Battlefield, where he's clearly harvesting the remains of plenty of warriors, or according to him, many great warriors that fought in the Shattering. And who fought in the Shattering? Well, definitely Radon, as we see in the opening credits. He got stomped out by Margaret the Fellow when he tried to roll up. Re. Didn't Morgoth face Radon at the capital? Probably, but I mean, I don't think this depiction actually is supposed to be of Radon. I think it's just an unfortunate uh, consequence of not really paying attention to details and having this thing maybe be a bit too distinct. But like I, I said earlier, it lacks the horns that come out of the sides of the helmet. Uh, this would be too tiny. Also, there's no Leonard. <laughs> um, and... Just the idea that he still would have been considered the strongest of all the demigods, despite losing to the Lord of Langdell, is just kind of uh, too much for me to really be on board with. 
blow up on the capital. Or more famously, he fought his half-sister, Melania, who was forced to go nuclear in her fight with him, causing the poor bastard to go insane, and his whole domain of the Caleb Wilds to basically turn into Chernobyl. Again, Radon got dealt a pretty fucked hand. Radagon probably despised Radon because of his red hair and what it meant to him. Which could be why Radon chose to idolize Godfrey so much, because his own father didn't really give him the time of day. Who knows really, that's, uh, that's very George R.R. R. Martin-esque. What with the uh, lions and the daddy issues and all that. But uh, it's not really confirmed or uh, not confirmed. But I suppose this theory could be the best ending Radon could have hoped for instead of just Having been killed a mad dog, at least a part of his powerful essence lives on in a young warrior jar, alongside the likes of people like Dialos and, of course, Alexander. There's always the possibility that it's just some nameless red-haired hero, as we know that red hair was supposedly a sign of heroic folks. But, um, that's a lot more boring than the other possibilities, in my opinion. But I suppose it should be stated. So this video is a little bit shorter than the ones I usually do, but it was a fun theory that I, want, I really wanted to cover, and uh, there really wasn't much more for me to expand on it, but uh, if there's anything I missed, uh, please let me know in the comments. I hope you guys found it informative. Please like and subscribe if you did. If you didn't, please let me know what I'm doing wrong. Uh, I'll see you guys next time. Have a good one. See ya. Alright, I like the video. This dude just always sounds so freaking bored when he's talking. It's just really funny to me. Um, probably unintentionally so, but, uh, anyway, yeah, I did really enjoy the video. It was short. It was sweet. Got to the point. It had some pretty nice speculation at the end and was very clear about what was more concrete and what was more, um, opinion with the exception of the stuff with the opening cutscene. He can, uh, go elsewhere for stating such blasphemy in front of this chat. New fear unlocked for making videos. <laughs> oh, Paul, it's nice to see you again. Generally, he doesn't sound like that. He probably had a bad day. Let's just spend like kind of two videos in a row. I mean, it's not a bad thing. It's kind of entertaining in its own way. Hey, Scott Lisa, welcome back to the stream. This is the Goron music. Oh, yeah, and just the music going with it is just kind of like the cherry on top. Spaghet says, I don't know, I think you can be the strongest and still lose, but it's a minor detail for sure. I don't think, like, the way that Radon is venerated by so many other people, I think it would be very convenient for, for him to not post the video of him getting his ass beat on Twitter, you know? But anyway, uh, I did like the video. If you guys liked it as well, I'm going to link it into chat. It's not something I'd heard before, surprisingly, but I do think there is a good amount of evidence that it could be true it's definitely excess or acceptable headcanon in my book so yeah the other stuff about it about alexander potentially eating the fire giant i also hadn't considered and i think that's also interesting as well and i am probably more on the side of honored man man that it seems more likely it was just like a radon thing but alexander still kind of finds himself lacking because it doesn't seem like he really would have beaten the fire giant alone, according to like the way he talks to us at Fair Missoula. And as I said in the 1.0 playthrough, it wasn't until I played the 1.0 version of the game that I realized when we meet um, Alexander in Fair Missoula that he wasn't referring to the dragon next to him as a god because that dragon doesn't exist on 1.0. So he was saying like when the Tarnished meets him there that the that giant that we defeated was almost like a god he was literally talking about the fire giant it just seems like a little bit of a out of place because in retail you more or less have to kill the dragon before talking to him otherwise it can just be kind of annoying to duel him the radon we fight is considerably weaker than normal yeah and i i feel like the radon, radon we fight could also be like on par with Morgoth. So if he was at a hundred percent, he would probably like wipe the floor with him. Goddess Baguette says, you feel like it was an internal design choice by the devs for the jars to carry the will of the warriors, but to be super fragile regardless. It's kind of tragic. Um, 
Yeah, I've wondered whether or not the jars are kind of like analogous to like the beast blood oozes and they just kind of became reanimated by the random stuff put inside them. There is like the one description that talks about them being like having a creator. And then there's another thing in 1.0 that makes it like a bit more explicit that they were like experiments into creating eternal life, which kind of uh, blew my mind and kind of saddened me at the same time. Cause I like the idea of them being like spontaneous emergences of life a bit more, but anyway, You didn't do the pacifist run if you think he can't solo the giant. Yeah, I will probably need to watch like those videos of uh, different boss fights to see how Morgoth would fare against Radon. But anyway, this is a good video. Go ahead and give him a like and a sub if you haven't. So, all right. Moving on from mod ha Monard Hadman. Moving on from Honored Madman. We have Crunchy with Elden Ring lore, Sex, Rebirth, and False Gods. So he's a member of the Roundtable Hold. I don't actually know if I've watched something from Crunchy before, which I feel kind of bad about because he's been a pretty uh, frequent contributor to the channel, uh, Discord, and even in some of the streams. So uh, hopefully we'll make up for some of that now just because I've wanted to keep myself in the dark for a long time about other people's content. So I'm very interested to see where this goes. Because this is obviously a very evocative title. And um, I typically don't analyze a lot of FromSoft games from too far of an outside, like more meta perspective. Um, I do it occasionally, but it's just often so much is a little bit different between like the English and Japanese. I'm maybe like pigeonholing myself covering those because we don't really have a lot of other content creators covering that stuff. So... Hopefully this is cool. This video contains spoilers for Demon Souls and Berserk. And I guess spoilers ahead. Here we go. In Season 4, Episode 3 of Star Trek The Next Generation, the android Data is called by a homing device to the house of his creator, the long thought to be dead Dr. Noonien Sung. This unexpected encounter offers Data the chance to ask his so-called father the most important question on his mind. Why was he created? Rather than directly answering Data's question, Sung sees an opportunity to teach something to his child. He replies with a question of his own. Why are humans fascinated by old things? Why do they cherish ancient buildings and antique relics? Data ponders this oddly tangential question for a moment, before responding that old things might represent a tie to the past. Humans are mortal, and they seem to need a sense of continuity to give life meaning, a sense of purpose. Sung seems pleased by this answer. He then asks Data whether this continuity runs in only one direction, backwards, towards the past. Data ponders the question for a moment again, then replies that, Perhaps this continuity is a factor in the human desire to procreate. With a perceptive look on his face, Sung responds, So, you believe that having children gives humans a sense of immortality? Finally answering Data's question. For mortal beings, the closest we might come to immortality is vicariously experiencing it through our children. The desire to have sex and procreate is nature's way of enforcing the continuity of life if not the immortality of an individual, then the immortality of a legacy or bloodline. But what if that weren't true? What if humans weren't mortal beings? In the lands between, true death is rare. Long ago, the Rune of Death was removed from the Elden Ring, the system of runes which determines the laws of the natural world. This new altered state of the world, and the regime which followed its precepts, was known as the Golden Order, and under its rule, those blessed by golden grace began to enjoy a deathless existence. Neither age nor sickness could destroy them, and the warm blessing of the Erd Tree healed all wounds. By plucking the forbidden shadow of destined death from the order of the world, and blessing the lands between with the grace of gold, Queen Merica the Eternal delivered unto mankind its greatest desire, the gift of immortality.
I like that uh, he did the whole gift of immortality in tandem with the you died screen. Um, but yeah, going back to the very beginning of the video, I think that was a very good quote to open with and really sets the tone of what to expect very well. So it's a bit more philosophical than I might have expected just based on the, the thumbnail. So uh, definitely interesting so far. Katie says, you'll probably go when he starts talking about Berserk to Void spoilers. Does anyone know when he starts talking about it? Unfortunately, I don't. But um, that's totally understandable. And uh, if you dip out, uh, thanks for joining in, Katie. And hopefully we'll see you next time. So the question is, do the people of the Lands Between still have sex? That might sound like an absurd question, but this isn't just hypothetical. That's kind of more or less what I was expecting from uh, the get-go, but he just uh, made a very tasteful uh, misdirection at first. In the 1.0 version of Elden Ring, the description for the turtle neck meat read as follows. Turtle meat is said to boost virility, but none in the Lands Between seem to have much appetite for it these days. In the Lands Between, the urge to reproduce has waned long ago. Now, it should go without saying that because this description comes from an outdated version of the game, it's technically not canonical. We don't know exactly why this description was changed, so we can't say for sure whether it fits the current state of the lore or not. However, it does beg the question why such a specific idea was written down in the first place. Thematically, this idea makes a certain kind of sense. In a world where individual immortality is a reality, there wouldn't necessarily be much of an impetus to procreate. All right, Katie, um, apparently he starts talking about Berserk at about the 30, 29 minute mark. He'll talk about Berserk and Carl Jung. And type 35, or type 5, I guess. Well, welcome to the stream, and thanks for letting us know about that. The various pieces of circumstantial evidence in the game related to this idea are unclear at best, and might suggest either direction. The most important turtle in the game is a pastor who oversaw the miraculous marriage of Radigan and Renala, which lines up with the thematic connection between turtles and sex expressed in the turtle neck meat description. We know of several children in the game, which might suggest a contradiction, but there are some odd circumstances that confuse the issue. I just had a terrible thought. What if... Oh man, this is going to really wreck some people. What if the reason why turtleneck meat was associated with virility is because they would kill the turtle who presided over a marriage ceremony and eat the neck before they consummated their marriage? But yeah, um, setting that cursed thought aside, uh, going back to the idea of the canonicity of the 1.0 description of the turtleneck meat, I think is important. And I did think that they took it out for a reason because it would kind of contradict the stuff potentially with like the land octopi ovaries or how Melina says like births continue and things like that. Here, maybe you'll leave earlier. That was awful. Uh, Noah asks, was someone supposed to eat turtle pope? I don't necessarily know, but that was just kind of one of the intrusive thoughts that I had just now. So, you're welcome. For example, Mikola and Melania were born of the autocestuous union of Merica and Radigan, an event which strains the imagination, to say the least. In her warning about the frenzied flame, Melina tells us that births continue in this world, which also seems to contradict the idea that no one's having sex. However, she also seems to be somewhat confused by the concept of being born of a mother, specifically. When she observes Bach being upset as a result of missing his mother, she says, Does being born of a mother mean one behaves in such a manner? This would be a slightly odd thing to say for someone who had been born by normal means. If not born by normal means, then how? Melina tells us that she was born at the foot of the Erd tree, and perhaps that's an indication of the method of her birth, birth by tree. In fact, birth by tree may be the primary method of birth or rebirth in the Lands Between. There's some circumstantial evidence which might support this idea. First and foremost, all life in the Lands Between is symbolized by a giant golden tree. 
Godwin is described as a scion of the Golden Bough, and maybe that's not just a metaphor, but rather a literal description of his origin. Now he lives within death, but the influence of his fractured life travels through tree roots. The statues of the Bald Monk and Radigan both appear to depict these characters emerging from a tree, and Radigan's icon also shows him emerging from flowering branches. In Millicent's questline, Gowery says that Millicent will flower anew as a Scarlet Valkyrie. Once again, this might be more literal than it seems at first. Although it's never explicitly stated, Millicent and her sisters seem to be related to Melania in some way, either figuratively or literally. But if they're Melania's daughters, no father is ever suggested. Perhaps they weren't born in the traditional manner, but instead sprouted, so to speak, from the pollination of Melania's blossom in the Battle of Ionia. Yeah, and as I've said before, I'm not the biggest fan of the idea of birth coming from the Erd Tree directly. However, somebody had mentioned something in one of the comments in my reaction to, I think, a tarnished archaeologist, and that it isn't necessarily mutually exclusive that Erd Tree birth would mean that there is no other kind of natural birth, which is oddly enough something I hadn't thought of from that perspective. So there might be something more to it that I hadn't considered from that perspective before. So Erdry birth and or like the Millicent millennia type of birth could be a specific thing, but that doesn't necessarily mean all birth is like that still. Rot is described as a cycle of death and rebirth. And as I explored in my last video, the cut item Miranda's Prayer indicates that the Miranda flowers used to be human. Some of the Erdtree Guardians have begun to sprout very similar flowers on their backs as part of an ancient pact with the Erdtree, which granted them renewed eternal life. A similar process to the cycle of rot is described in the remembrance of the regal ancestor spirit. Life sprouts from death, as it does from birth. The ancestral followers await new buds, the same word used to describe Millicent and her sisters. Millicent and Melania both need to be killed in order for them to be reborn through rot, an expression of the idea that life sprouts from death. Plants and trees draw nutrients from the ground, and in a world with a history of violence and bloodshed, those nutrients come in part from dead bodies. We can see how much of the landscape of Limgrave is in fact composed of ancient tombstones. The Halig tree was fed by Mikola's blood, the minor Erd trees are fed by the viscera contained within warrior jars, and the Erd tree is fed by those buried at its roots. Taking all these observations into account, we might make a speculative leap and rephrase the remembrance of the regal ancestor spirit to read as follows. Plant life sprouts from death, as animal or beast life does from birth. Several lore theorists, like Tarnished Archaeologist, have already suggested the idea that people could be reborn through the Erd Tree. It's worth saying that there's no explicit support for this idea, besides circumstantial evidence which might be more metaphorical in nature, like the tapestries in Lendell which depict a tree with people emerging from its branches. However, to steelman this theory, when Dee talks to a corpse outside Summonwater Village, he says, Your soul will return to the Erd Tree in time which implies that the soul also originated from the Erd Tree. The Dung Eater also speaks of people being reborn as if this is a natural occurrence. While it requires a bit of... I don't... Is this not in the English the idea that Erd Tree burial is like a rebirth? Um, I think there's something else. I mean, there's the one... Cor uh, not corpse. The one ghost in the like pretty much the first catacombs to the west of the first step in uh, Limgrave. I forget the name of it. Actually, I, I could just pull up this footage. Probably be easier. Um, let me type in ghost. I pretty much use this on almost like all of my lore videos. If if I had like a, a bingo card for a, like my lore videos, you'd either get um, me comparing things to the Japanese or like this video. Our hallowed resting place is violated. We know this one, isn't it? Yeah, to refuse the Erd Tree's call to return to live in death sickening. I don't think that was the one I was thinking of, though. I was thinking of... 
Do I not have it? Oh, no, this one. It was this one. A proper death means returning to the Erd Tree. Have patience until the time come comes and the roots call to you. So there is kind of uh, evidence to suggest that. However, sorry, to suggest that people came from the Erd Tree because they're told to like they'll return to it. However, I think you could also make the argument that... They may have explicitly gotten grace from the Erd Tree, and grace is tied to, like, memory and stuff. So, like, putting that aside, the idea that one would get their grace from the Erd Tree would, and they would need to recycle it could be tied into this. And so they don't necessarily have to have, like, their souls come from the Erd Tree or, and or their bodies. Goddess Baguette says, do we have evidence of anyone coming back to life after Urge Tree Burial? You've only seen spirits and remembrances. Uh, Teen Sith asks Lutel. No, I wouldn't say Lutel does not count because she's turned into ashes. So this is like a good roundabout way to like bring up one of the questions that I've thought for a long time is how come there are so many spirit ashes in these catacombs? Does that mean like people used to be burned at one point in history. I mean, I think the simplest answer is they didn't really think about it too much and it was just easier to put like an item in there that would allow us to summon things. That would be a good reward for exploring catacombs. But um, anyway, the whole idea of ashes, I think, comes into play that once the Erd Tree became disconnected from its roots, I don't think things were able to return to it like the one ghost says. And I think that's why we get spirit ashes, because normally the Erd Tree would absorb the spirits and or the gold of the dead and everything like that. Golden excrement must be on the bingo, that and soap. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, I don't think we actually have any evidence of a spirit ash that predates the shattering, believe it or not. And there are a couple ones that are like arguable, like the fair Missoula beast man, but it is unclear when the beast man or the beast men would have died. Unfortunately, Noah says maybe the Erd tree burial thing doesn't work as well as people in the world think it does. Thus the Erd tree isn't really absorbing souls. Um, yeah, sorry. I meant to make that point, but I kind of forgot because it's kind of hard to remember exactly everything that I want to talk about. Cause there's always a lot of it, but yeah, I meant to say that, I think to like the the ghosts perspectives what they say is right but since this dude is a commoner and an adherent of the golden order most likely this is kind of their perspective on how they think death should work and it doesn't fully align with how death actually works and things along those lines so yeah it's unfortunate to say, oh, like this NPC doesn't know what he's talking about, but I think he does, but he doesn't like he's obviously making the observation that things aren't returning to the Erd Tree, but he doesn't really know why and doesn't exactly know what a proper death is, despite being dead, I guess. Just kind of crazy to think about. Uh, Godwin's burial at the roots probably didn't help too. Yeah. Scalizi says maybe they didn't deserve a burial and were cremated instead. Um, I don't know about that because it seems like they would all post date the shattering. Whereas to me, it would make more sense if things are cremated before the Erd Tree due to the thing due to <laughs> not due to due to the things related to the death birds and using fire in their funerary rites. Isn't the Erd Tree dead, so it wouldn't absorb souls? No, the Erd Tree, I think, is still sort of alive, just in a kind of stasis, but it's been disconnected from the roots. So it's no longer absorbing all of the souls from, like, the minor Erd Tree uh, catacombs and things like that. I have a leap to make the assumption that people could be literally born from the Erd Tree. 
I find this idea compelling, at least in part because it might explain some of the similarities between different individuals, like Radigan and Godwin, for example, or Ronnie and Melina. I'll return to this idea later, but first I need to provide some context for how this might make sense. Over the past year, I've been examining the story of Elden Ring and trying to piece it together. Although I've been having fun just trying to understand the plot, I'm more interested in understanding what the story is saying, what the themes are, what it's all about. One of the things which has been floating around my mind for a while is the theme of birth, and in particular the idea of virgin birth, or parthenogenesis, asexual reproduction. There are several observations which inform this idea. First, compared to Miyazaki's previous works, Elden Ring draws much more heavily upon Christian imagery. For example, symbolically equating Merica with Jesus Christ on the cross, or Moog with Lucifer, or even the long march of the tarnished and the exodus of the Israelites. I mean, obviously, I think this is a little bit cherry picked, especially uh, since we watched a video related to Bloodborne a little bit before this. But anyway, um, I do think despite that, Crunchy is kind of right in that there is a lot of uh, subtextual like Christian imagery in Elden Ring. But unfortunately, I think you could also argue that a lot of the so-called Christian imagery could be related to like Norse mythology. And I think like a lot of the visual imagery of Elden Ring is almost like the equivalent of a Rorschach where people can find what they impress upon it themselves. While it's dangerous to draw too many conclusions about the story from the sources of inspiration behind Elden Ring, it does raise the question of whether or not virgin birth is an element of the story, especially considering that the name Merica is a diminutive form of Mary. Second, the broader theme of birth, children, and legacy has become increasingly important throughout Miyazaki's games. In Dark Souls, it was fairly simple and abstract. It was just about whether you decided to continue Gwyn's legacy or not. But throughout the following games, that theme of legacy has become much more personalized and central to the story, probably in part as a result of Miyazaki becoming a father during this time. As far as Elden Ring is concerned, essentially the entire story is based around a conflict between Marika's children, each fighting for their inheritance. Third, as this theme relates to Merica specifically, there are some odd questions I have about the Newman, a race which she either belongs to or is related to. The only other Newman we know of in the game are the Black Knife Assassins, who are said to be all women, which is curious, and the character creation menu tells us that Newman are long-lived but seldom born, which begs the question, is there something unique about Newman reproduction, and does it have something to do with them being, apparently, exclusively female? Newman are said to be the descendants of Den- Isn't the ability to use like a type A body to become a Newman kind of a little bit contradictory to that? I mean, I, I like the idea over overall, don't get me wrong, but it's just a little bit unfortunate that like perhaps this uh, origin class wasn't race locked or sorry, uh, like sex locked. Denizens of another world. And in my view, this most likely refers to them originating from the Eternal Cities, below the Lands Between. In the Japanese text, the word which has been translated as another world is ikai, which could also be read as spirit world or underworld, both of yeah. which might describe the world underneath the Lands Between. This would also line up with Rogier's dialogue in which he claims that the Black Knife Assassins are scions of the Eternal City. Currently, these cities are occupied by the Nox. The Nox have an odd working relationship with giant ants, several of which contain Newman runes. This is interesting for a number of reasons, not least of which that, in real life, several species of ants, along with other members of the order Hymenoptera, reproduce parthenogenetically. Among the Nox, there are monks who at least appear to be male, so there doesn't seem to be a compelling reason to think there's anything unique about their reproductive process. However, the giants, which occupy a central throne in the two named Eternal Cities, both appear to be female, which is interesting. In addition, the Nox... What is Crunchy's source for that? Is it because they, like, have robes on? Because I don't necessarily think that means they're female, unless there's something more concrete to go with that. Like, maybe the shawls? I don't know. Nox attempted to create a Lord of Night, 
which might suggest the need for a male being specifically. There's reasonably good evidence to suggest that the Albinorix were created by the Nox out of silver. In Smotown's video on the Albinorix, he proposed the theory that perhaps the first generation Albinorix develop from female to male throughout their lifespan. We only ever see young females and elderly males among the first generation, whereas the second generation Albinorix lack any obvious sex-defining features. If it's true that the first generation Albinorix begin as females and end up as males, it might parallel the development of Merica into Radigan, although there's still a lot of uncertainty as to how exactly he came about. Let me back that up just a little bit there. I just want to make sure I'm following that properly. Albinorix were created by the Nox out of silver. In Smotown's video on the Albinorix, he proposed the theory that perhaps the first generation Albinorix develop from female to male throughout their lifespan. Oh, right, right, right. We only ever see young females and elderly males among the first generation, whereas the second generation Albinorix lack any obvious sex-defining features. Yeah, so that's something that I don't necessarily believe myself, but I don't think it's anything that I could disprove either. So, yeah, anyway. If it's true that the first generation Albinorix begin as females and end up as males, it might parallel the development of Merica into Radigan, although there's still a lot of uncertainty as to how exactly he came about. Biologically speaking, the Y gene in mammals, which differentiates males from females, only begins expression several weeks into the gestation process. So in a loose vernacular sense, all males start out as female, and only later become male. It's worth pointing out that, besides Mikola, all of the Empyreans that we know of are female. Mikola appears to be stuck at a prepubescent age, and he also appears to have a female alter ego, or at least some connection with the apparently feminine Saint Trina. Empyreans are candidates for godhood, and the role of god in the Lands Between, at least as far as Merica is concerned, is to be vessel for the Elden Ring, among other things, which might suggest the necessity for some kind of womb, at least in a figurative sense. Symbolically, Mother Nature is obviously female, so it makes a certain kind of sense that the roughly equivalent role in the story of Elden Ring would require some kind of female attributes. I feel like that's a little bit of a stretch and maybe a bit more like Western-centric, because there have been like cultures that thought that weather is more like related to like masculine traits, but um that's not like too important i just want to say like yeah whatever while the concept of birth in elden ring is surprisingly ambiguous we do get some information about rebirth radigan's amber egg now held by Renala, allows for us to be reborn it's interesting that radigan broke his vow and left Renala for another woman leaving only this golden egg Renala now appears to be in a dissociative state of mind, obsessed with producing a child that we might presume to be a reincarnation of Rani, or perhaps a new body for herself. But whatever she's doing, it seems to be so far unsuccessful, only producing disabled and imperfect copies. One reading of this situation could be that the amber egg is symbolically an ovary, and Renala is now menopausal or otherwise unable to give birth, producing only these magical miscarriages, so to speak. The egg is also interesting considering the symbolism of the cuckoo as it relates to Raya Lucaria. In real life, cuckoos are brood parasites, birds who plant their eggs in the nests of other species, the origin of the word cuckold or cuck. This might suggest that Rani is in fact the bastard child of Radigan and Merica, deceitfully inserted into the Carrion family for reasons unknown. That might explain why a depiction of Rani appears in the opening narration accompanied by the line, Merica's children. But all of this is extremely speculative, so let's return to the concept of rebirth. So, I mean, Ania also says the demigods are the direct descendants of Merica, like the demigods all. Um, but that's not that big a deal because, like, Merica is Radigan, so in a certain sense, like, they're all children of Merica, even, like, setting that stuff aside, arguably. But yeah, yeah, I guess that kind of really depends on your personal interpretation of the fusion of Merica and Radigan. So for me, at least, I don't think there's enough evidence to say that Merica and Radigan were like two actual separate beings. 
Um, until a certain point. But anyway, I, I think that's just kind of a neither here nor there right now. Mechanically speaking, rebirth through the amber egg means that we can redistribute the character attributes which we've enhanced since arriving in the lands between. Those enhancements came from Melina's power to turn runes into strength, an ability shared by finger maidens. The fact that this power appears to be held specifically by women, along with the connection to Renala's rebirth mechanic, implies that at least thematically this is related to women's unique capability to bear children. Now the curious thing about both of these processes is how they're connected to the theme of plants and trees. The amber egg is made of golden amber, and since amber comes from trees, it seems reasonable to assume that the amber egg came from the golden erd tree. The rune items tell us that runes are grace, and grace also comes from the erd tree. And most informatively, if we're killed, any runes that we carry, which haven't been integrated into our body by Melina's power, are dropped and immediately begin to sprout into tiny golden trees. In my view, this is as clear as FromSoft ever gets in saying that the golden erd tree is essentially the same thing as these dropped runes. However, in order to understand what's really going on here, we should begin by figuring out exactly what runes are. And in order to do that, I'd like to start by approaching this question from a slightly unusual angle. Shortly after Dark Souls first released, creative director Hidetaka Miyazaki appeared on a gaming podcast called Game no Shokutaku. At one point, the interviewer asked him whether he built the game around the story or the other way around. He replied, Basically, we worked on the story afterwards. We started with the layout of the game itself with minimum story around it. It's story for the game before game for the story for me. So as long as it meets the game's requirements in order to create immersion for the player, it's all good. That interview was a decade ago, so Miyazaki's views may have changed by now. No, I don't think you really need to like backpedal there. I think it's really clear that it's always been like the rule of cool. And I think even with Elden Ring, there's some really good examples of that because of how different 1.0 is from the retail build of Elden Ring with... Banish Knights occupying Lane Dell, the lack of the Oracle envoys in Lane Dell, and just various different enemy placements and different descriptions as well. So yeah, I think uh it's it's always just been about the rule of cool, and it's really more or less the fans that actually make up the the real lore of the game. But yeah, going back to like a lot of what he says about like the Empyreans and their feminine qualities, that's more or less how I kind of took what the role of a vessel or a god should be in Elden Ring. So, so far, I think we're on the same page for like a lot of things, but with some, you know, fairly minor differences. Uh, Teen Sith says they don't think it's a bad thing to revise or wing it at all either. For some reason, a lot of people in the fandom speak of it disparagingly. It's just because um, they want like a more handcrafted experience. And if things are like written on the fly or retroactively, perhaps it kind of diminishes the value of the quote unquote internal logic of these worlds. So... I kind of feel that way at times because of the way we end up in a few like dead ends in terms of like following the lore as well as the way we end up with like potentially contradictions at times like that's always a bit vexing and I do wish the games were more consistent because of course most games aren't written in this style that FromSoft employs so it's just kind of a out of the norm for something to be this rich in its world building and its lore, yet also careless at the same time, I guess, if that makes sense. Uh, Spaghet says, Average fans want the idealized version of a story. It's hard to understand what makes a story good and the compromise needs that that's needed to get the game made. Yeah. Well said. All right, so let's go back into the video here. 
Elden Ring was certainly different in the respect that George R. R. Martin contributed story elements in the early stages of development. However, I still think that this quote demonstrates Miyazaki's preference for a certain style of video game design. He prefers to start with the gameplay and develop the narrative around it. One example of this approach would be the Augite of Souls from Demon's Souls. There's a good gameplay reason to want the player to have some light surrounding them in dark areas, so Miyazaki took that gameplay idea and gave it some narrative context. The Augite of Souls is a stone which contains souls and thus projects the light of those souls around the player. More broadly speaking, this approach to game design explains why death is canonical in all of FromSoft's action RPGs. Failing a challenge and retrying it is a staple of game design, so Miyazaki took that mechanic and made it part of the narrative. In fact, it's really the central part of the narrative in all of his games. With all this in mind, it seems reasonable to assume that where there are similarities between mechanics in the various games created by Miyazaki, that we might also find similarities between the narrative context provided for those mechanics. Runes in Elden Ring aren't fundamentally a new idea, they're just the latest iteration of a mechanic which has existed in all of the Soulsborne games, appearing as souls in Demon Souls in the Dark Souls games, and as blood echoes in Bloodborne. So what I'd like to do now is examine- And I would pretty much just hard agree with everything Crunchy just said right there. The first version of this template in Demon Souls, in order to better understand how Miyazaki first imagined a narrative for this mechanic. Obviously, there's a limit to how much this can inform us about runes in Elden Ring, but I think it'll provide an interesting perspective from which to interpret the game. On the first day, mankind was granted a soul, and with it, clarity. These are the words which open demon souls, and they tell us in fairly straightforward terms what souls are, or at least what they're about. Souls provide clarity. They have something to do with perception or understanding. We could analogize that there's something like consciousness. For example, the miners in Stonefang have lost their souls, and as a result, they've become like mindless automatons. Consciousness is very mysterious, and we still don't really understand it. Everyone has the experience of a singular, indivisible quality of what it's like to be. And this experience is difficult to square with a purely physical world. There is a gap between the objective world of molecules and cells and chemistry and the subjective world of thoughts and perceptions and feelings which we actually experience. We like to think that we all exist in the objective world, but in a sense, the reality we exist in is the conscious experience of a very narrow window into that objective world. There's an infinite number of things around us which lie just outside our conscious perception, and at some level none of these things exist for us. The reality we experience is focused on a much more narrow set of things which are relevant to our beliefs. An example of this can be demonstrated by the simons Shabri Selective Attention Test. If you're unfamiliar with the test, I'd recommend pausing this video and taking the test by clicking on the link in the description below, because I'm about to spoil the results. This the test really is funny. a video of two teams passing several basketballs back and forth. Participants are asked to count the number of times the team wearing white shirts passes the ball. After about 25 seconds, the video ends, and participants are asked to provide their answer. The correct answer is 15 passes, and most people get it correct or close to correct. But then, the participants are asked if they noticed the gorilla. About 10 seconds into the video, someone in a gorilla suit slowly walks straight into the middle of the screen and beats their chest directly at the camera before continuing to walk off screen. The gorilla is present for about 10 seconds, almost half the video's length, and you might think that you would notice something so obvious and absurd, but only about 50% of the participants notice the gorilla. The prompt for the video provides a value structure, which participants use to filter the relevant and irrelevant parts of what they're seeing. You could say that the prompt defines a type of order, which is necessary for perception. For half of the participants, the gorilla might as well not exist, because their beliefs about what's important in the video define their attention in such a narrow way that their conscious experience is limited to the ball and the players in white shirts. Yeah, the first time I saw that video, I uh, failed miserably. <laughs> so yeah, it's one of my uh, favorite uh, videos on the internet. 
And they've even like done some other versions of that. And I, I've seen like a more recent one, but I can't remember what it is off the top of my head. But yeah, I, it's uh, it's kind. Of, I, I'm kind of curious where Crunchy is going with this. I mean, obviously, like with the lore stuff, I think this could like tie into like the characters' perspectives. So I'm curious if that's where Crunchy is going to go with it as well. Less dramatic examples of selective attention are commonplace. If you've ever played Punch Buggy, you might have been surprised that you start to notice a disproportionate number of Volkswagen Beetles on the road. Or perhaps you've had the experience of spending 10 minutes searching for an object like your glasses or your keys, only to realize that it was on your person the entire time. The presupposition that the object exists in the set of locations which you're searching through can preclude you from seeing the object in a different location. Even if that location is something incredibly obvious, like on your head or in the palm of your hand. This is all a bit abstract, but the point I'm making here is that the world we perceive, our subjective reality, is greatly informed by our beliefs. But Demon Souls takes that idea a step further. In Demon Souls, beliefs don't just define subjective reality, but objective reality. When the Soul Arts was introduced to Boletaria, it allowed people to extract and manipulate souls, to use that power of consciousness and perception for their own ends. Many people lost their souls and lost their clarity, and as a result, the world literally lost its clarity. A colorless fog swept in. Many of the bosses in Demon Souls appear to be physical manifestations of myths or stories. For example, Alfred, Knight of the Tower, was an intimidating warrior with an enormous shield, and through the power of souls, the stories of his prowess took on a physical reality as the Tower Knight. The same could be said of Archer Ulin and Knight Metas, the myths of whom became the demons Phalanx and Penetrator, respectively. The image of a fantastic monster with a bird for its head, depicted on a shield, took physical form as the Adjudicator. When the burrowers of Stonefang discovered the skeleton of an enormous dragon, they feared it would one day revive, and through the power of souls, that belief became a self-fulfilling prophecy. Even the fat officials convey this idea. Wear the evil grin of a stone-hearted sadist for long enough, and your face literally turns into a mask of black stone. And this is an idea that's also been explored in other games. I know Persona 2, uh, real, or is it Persona 3 that really delves into it? Maybe both of those ones spend a while, and I haven't delved into those games as deeply as I wanted. But I know like the rumor system is really becomes really important in those games. Obviously, their mothers never told them, stop making that face or it'll stick that way. And also there's like Silent Hill. There is this one optional mission where if your character, I, I don't remember which Silent Hill game it was. If they get told about this rumor of like this monster, I think in the subway, they will eventually encounter it. But if they're never told that rumor, that monster more or less doesn't even exist, which implies that the monster is a creation of the main character's mind, which is kind of really trippy and really cool to think about. Yeah, and as uh, Chadwick says very well here, uh, what you believe is what happens. So uh, just kind of uh, giving some more context that this isn't limited to Demon Souls, but I do think Crunchy is bringing up good points in that their characters' beliefs of the world absolutely influence them here. This idea of beliefs directly affecting reality is also present in gameplay. If you have enough faith, enough conviction in an entity or belief system, you can literally perform miracles. Your belief has a direct impact on reality. Similarly, a greater understanding of the principles which define the world, through greater intelligence, allows you to affect the world with your mind by sorcery. All of the magic in Demon Souls is sourced from souls, and their ability to define reality through belief. So now let's return to Elden Ring, and let's see if any of this lines up with the way that runes are depicted. Like the souls in Demon Souls, runes are acquired from death, either by looting corpses or simply killing living beings. This implies that, like souls, runes are some kind of immortal essence or energy intrinsic to all life. One difference between runes and souls is obviously the name, and to me this suggests an even stronger sense of the interpretation I just laid out. 
In real life, runes are a type of language or a system of symbols. They're a way of representing concepts, the metaphysical objects which define our internal experience. So we could say that in Elden Ring, runes are not just the immortal essence of life, but specifically the concepts and principles which define the metaphysical aspects of life. The and this might tie back into what Crunchy was saying in the earliest portions of the videos of the video with uh, the kinds of Christian imagery depicted throughout Elden Ring, because in that religion, depending on like your uh, like branch beliefs of it or whatnot, like the word was with God and God was the word. So like you could say that the idea of the soul is still technically like a word, even in Christianity, because like God is the word, you know, so Tying that into like runes and Elden Ring being related to souls, it, it just kind of does tie into that Christian imagery, I guess, is what I'm trying to say here. <laughs> you thought bird was the word? Indeed. Welcome back to the stream, Zero. This interpretation seems to be alluded to by Melina. If you use runes to level up at Grace while Melina is present, she says, Share them with me. Your thoughts, your ambitions, the principles you would follow. My mans didn't even press R3 so we could get a better look at her. Like in Demon Souls, magic in Elden Ring can be performed by the player according to our intelligence and our faith. Another example of the concepts which form our internal experience magically affecting the physical world. When we perform one of these magic spells, a sigil, representing the school of thought from which the magic originates, appears in the air, which is at least analogous to a rune, if not a type of rune itself. On a grander scale, the Elden Ring itself is a rune, or a system of runes, which determines the structure of reality. When the Rune of Death was removed from the ring, the principle of death was literally removed from the world. Several mending runes can be used to repair the ring and instantiate a new type of order, according to the principles of that rune. These mending runes are representative of a certain worldview held by the creator of the rune. They represent a belief system. In this sense, the Elden Ring could be described as a magical conduit, which allows the world to be literally and physically defined by a particular system of beliefs. And words. And this thing has kind of always been funny to me, the idea that technically... The rune of death is a literal word of death in a way. So it's like, yeast? I thought you said weast. Is, is that literally what it means for like death to be no longer the world? Do they just say death instead? Obviously, uh, these are kind of jokes, but uh, if, if you really take the idea that runes are literally words, it would make sense that, like, how much sense does it make for like Ronnie to steal a, a fragment of a word to kill somebody and like, now that she's stolen the fragment of the word, it no longer manifested properly. Um, obviously, that would just go to speak to the metaphysical nature of words and or souls in this game. This interpretation clears up some confusion which I initially had about some of the terminology in the game. For example, the term Golden Order seems to alternately refer to a particular configuration of the runes which make up the Elden Ring, as well as an organized religion made up of people. This is a bit confusing, but if we understand the Elden Ring to be a configuration of concepts and principles which define the experience of living beings, then you can see how these two definitions are in a sense the same thing. Another example I'll probably need to back this up because uh, Chadwick said something very interesting in chat, which reminded me of something else. So I just kind of like forgot how to watch and listen, apparently. But anyway, uh, Chadwick said, if you don't have a word for a thing, you may not know it exists at all. And that's a very, very important topic in philosophy. The idea that language literally shapes our thoughts, which there's a lot of weight and truth to that. And of course, it's very difficult to talk about in a more abstract slash objective way because language is so subjective in the terms of how people perceive it. And it just kind of goes back to the idea of if I were to say chair, what kind of chair do you envision 
when I say the word chair versus what kind of chair that I'm envisioning when I'm saying it and all those kinds of things. And in a weird abstract way, we can even tie it back into the like the whole gorilla uh, experiment thing that Crunchy was talking about a moment ago. So I think I might be like misremembering this, but I think uh, Noam Chomsky talks about that idea quite a bit and that in certain languages, like the concept of time doesn't exist the same way that it does in English. So how do these people actually perceive certain aspects of time is a very fascinating question that gets brought up in like linguistic and philosophical circles. So um, I wish I had more concrete examples that I could think of off the top of my head. And that's something that's vastly fascinating to me. But of course, I'm a bit of a linguistics and like philosophy nerd or just like education nerd in general. Uh, Scott Lazy says it goes back back to Plato's ideas of the forms. Yeah, kind of, sort of. Yeah, a big problem in translation, too. Not all concepts exist in all cultures. Exactly. Which is why I try to give like so many like translators notes for things. And it's a, obviously a thing that I focus uh, very highly on in this channel. Ben Brennan, nice to see you again. The word is more like the rules of reality in the game The Elden Ring itself. Another way you've heard it explained is that the language of God is words that are the things themselves. And yeah, that's a, a good way to clarify what I was saying earlier. Thank you. Noah says, they read about words that exist in other languages. You may not have this quite right, but there's a tribe that has a word for the urge to cut off your head. So like in English, we would say like intrusive thoughts, but that of course isn't like one word. It's two different words. And that doesn't necessarily correlate to the same thing okay so here's a, a good example a concrete one kind of of like how language influences people so obviously uh when i say anorexia some people are going to assume that it just means an, an eating disorder where you don't eat pretty much anything at all because you have a phobia of becoming fat perhaps and obviously that's very understood in like Western science. However, that idea in and of itself is actually a Western thought about a behavior that may not describe all instantiations of that behavior. So unfortunately, this kind of ruined how we could do research about it in other cultures but the, as soon as like we came up with the idea of anorexia as a label for this specific like eating disorder, it went on to label all kind of disorders like that. And we, as a consequence of that, we didn't need to look any further because we were already focused on anorexia. So going back to that idea of like lo looking for the balls instead of like noticing the gorilla in the video, we had psychologists in china that once they heard about anorexia and they were treating people in china with anorexia they gained a preconceived notion that it had to be related to fat avoidance whereas some of their chinese patients who had no idea of like that kind of like thing going on and they may have been anorexic for a completely different reason and so we've kind of lost an avenue of research into anorexia that is greater than just like fat phobia i guess so that's just kind of like one way that language can shape thoughts and words i guess can shape beliefs <laughs> El Gusto, you uh, came in at a poor time. You'll probably just need to back up because it's very difficult to uh, explain that in a nutshell. Uh, Stella says English has a freakish amount of words for colors compared to other languages. Oh, yeah, of course. That's the other like prime example. So I think it's like Homer described in perhaps the Iliad that this one of the seas was quote unquote wine colored and um, whether or not, you know, you're, you're dealing with white wine or red wine, most people aren't going to say that the ocean is wine colored in uh, modern day terminology. We would say 
perhaps it's blue, perhaps it's greenish or gray, depending on where you are and like what the weather is like. So the idea that people in the more ancient world didn't need to distinguish the color blue as much because it didn't appear in nature and they didn't need to differentiate like blue food groups from like green stuff or like brown stuff might be a reason why the color blue is something that's only become thought of as more distinct in more recent human history. And this is apparently a feature or a phenomenon that's kind of like a global thing where like more indigenous slash tribal cultures also don't distinguish or like don't have a word that distinguishes blue as much as we do in like English and stuff. You would say that water can be like white wine. Yeah, but like when it's in the ocean, it doesn't exactly really match that. In dusk, seashores can appear purplish. And that could be an explanation. And uh, of course, there's more to it. But my point is it, it goes beyond the Homer or Homer and the Iliad. So it's it's like cross-cultural, cross -cultural, surprisingly enough. All right, so... Um, yeah, okay, I did back up the video because I, I wanted to like re-listen to what Crunchy was saying because I got distracted by uh, Chadwick's original comment. So nonetheless, uh, that was a really fun aside. Hope you guys enjoyed it. The runes which make up the Elden Ring, as well as an organized religion made up of people. This is a bit confusing, but if we understand the Elden Ring to be a configuration of concepts and principles which define the experience of living beings, then you can see how these two definitions are in a sense the same thing. Another example comes from the intro of the game. The narrator describes how the Elden Ring was shattered, and then following that shattering was a war known as the Shattering. This seems unnecessarily confusing at first, but again with the interpretation that I've proposed it makes a bit more sense. There's no fundamental difference between the shattering of the system of concepts and principles which organize life and the breaking down of society into division and conflict. There is a logical implication to this observation. theory which recontextualizes the assumptions most lore theorists have made about the cosmos of Elden Ring, and it goes something like this. Let's take it for granted, for the moment, that beliefs have some magical impact on reality. What do you suppose would happen if a large number of people believed in the same thing, the same religious doctrine, the same divine entity guiding the hand of fate? What you'd expect is that this belief would somehow manifest in reality. This divine entity would become real in some way. It might actually determine fate. There's a heuristic called Occam's Razor, which is a way of evaluating competing theories. Occam's Razor says that entities should not be multiplied beyond necessity, which is a somewhat obscure way of saying that if you've got two theories which both explain a situation, the one which requires the existence of extra things or people which you haven't observed is a less reliable theory than the one which is simpler. Most people have assumed that the greater will is some sort of creature or entity with its own agency, which exerts influence over the lands between. But if we apply Occam's razor here, there's no need to presume the existence of such a creature. All of the greater will's influence and actions could be sufficiently explained as a manifestation of the metaphysical concepts which characterize life. In this case, particularly the belief or desire for a divine unifying order. A similar idea is expressed in Kentaro Miura's seminal manga Berserk. Which All right, so spoiler warning for Berserk. And just to go back briefly to what he was saying here about the greater will being a creature or something, and this is my headcanon, and I want to be very clear, like, this, of course, doesn't correlate to the game very strongly in terms of, like, textual evidence for it. But the way that I kind of look at the greater will, which makes the most sense to me based on, like, previous FromSoft games, is that it could be a kind of collective unconsciousness that's more or less the unspoken drive and desire to stay alive and to procreate and to live because that's something I think shows up time and time again with the darkness and hu humanity sprites of Dark Souls. It shows up with the blood echoes and Bloodborne. Um, Sekido kind of doesn't exactly have that, but it also does 
with a desire to stay alive with using the uh, dra divine dragon heritage and how that clinging on to life creates stagnation and suffering in that world, which, you know, is almost verbatim with like the things that Seath does in Dark Souls 1, but I digress. And I think that could also apply back into Elden Ring where runes are runes because they're alive and what is like the driving force behind life behind life uh, to live you know so that's just kind of my thought on the greater will for now and we'll see if that pans out or just kind of falls on its face perhaps with the dlc uh just kidding we're not going to have any answers because that's more or less uh how from soft operates of the metaphysical concepts which characterize life. In this case, particularly the belief or desire for a divine unifying order. A similar idea is expressed in Kentaro Miura's seminal manga Berserk, which has been a huge source of inspiration for Miyazaki's works in general and Elden Ring in particular. In Berserk, when Griffith undergoes his transformation into Femto, he experiences a kind of vision wherein he's transported to another plane of reality. In the midst of the swirling vortex he arrives at is an enormous heart atop a caduceus, which calls itself the idea of evil, or God. God explains that it is the darkness that dwells in every human heart. It was born from the ocean of feelings which all humans have deep in their souls, a common consciousness. Obeying the will of the essence of humankind, the idea of evil weaves the course of destiny, enforced by the five-fingered hand of God. This flow of destiny, or causality, is, among other things, later referred to by the egg-shaped apostle as the guidance of a greater will. In other words, the composite will of humanity. Miura was heavily influenced by the work of psychoanalyst Carl Jung, and this plot element in particular seems to draw from Jung's idea of the collective unconscious. Jung believed that, in dreams and waking imagination, every human experiences a shared, numinous world filled with archetypes, such as the Great Mother or the Tree of Life. Whether literally or figuratively, he believed that these experiences of the unconscious mind were a kind of communion with a divine world that all humans could access. He also believed that explorations of occult practices like alchemy could provide insight into this unconscious world of archetypes. Jung's work and psychoanalysis in general have been thoroughly rebutted by critics since his death, but his ideas have been highly influential in the realm of storytelling, and I think this helps provide some context for the greater will in Elden Ring. So... Uh, John Bailey Owen has a really good question. Unfortunately, I think it's going to like really kind of sidetrack the video stuff. So I apologize to Crunchy if you watch this after the fact. But John asks, sort of a vague question, but what are the biggest quote-unquote answers we have previously gotten from DLCs? So it's a lot of the stuff that I would say are like the quote-unquote answers are more or less in the subtext for a lot of the games. So in Bloodborne, we do have a lot of subtextual answers as to what like the nightmares are and what I would argue like the collective unconsciousness of mankind conjures up in that world in the cosmic ocean of a nightmare. So that's kind of my answer, at least with Bloodborne, and that's like the nightmares are related to the dead and it's, they're all related to the cosmos, which wasn't quite as clear before the DLC was released. In Dark Souls 1, I don't really think there's like that much of a straightforward answer other than like the dark is res like it responds to emotions. And when left alone to its own devices, it can be pretty tranquil and serene. And that kind of reflects the nature of humanity that when something is riled up it will become more violent and dangerous perhaps and then there's also like the three the dlcs with dark souls 2 and that has to do with like the crowns and what it means to be 
human and to like conquer the undead curse but i think like two kind of really fails on like a narrative aspect for multiple reasons and two is probably the exception whereas i feel like dark souls 2 probably gives us the most insight as to the underlying mechanics of the world or the universe of dark souls and then dark souls 3 gives us the answers as to like should we keep continuing the cycle of fire when it keeps corrupting the age that follows and that ultimately to have a new age the answer means it has to come from letting go of the previous age i guess confirmation of the doll's identity nature of the layered realities yeah that it does kind of help a little bit but you could have made that argument that reality was layered on it onto itself in the base game because you could see the nightmare of mentis from the nightmare frontier but nobody knew what the shit masks were and then with Sekido, we got no answers because there was no real dlc so hopefully that answers your question a little bit but yeah kind of hard to like give direct answers to that unfortunately so going back to the video. I think the greater will is exactly what its name describes at face value. It's nothing more than a greater will. The greater sum total of humanity's collective will to create order in the world. In fact, it's possible that the other cosmological entities in Elden Ring's story, known as the Outer Gods, are also nothing more than manifestations of the metaphysical elements of life. Fundamental concepts like death or decay might be imbued with the semblance of agency as a result of the magical manifestation of the belief systems surrounding these concepts. Perhaps the world. So, yeah, I would say that I, I'm kind of on the same page as Crunchy in saying that I think the greater will is a just will that is great, you know, a, a cosmic will that like floats out there. I'm not entirely sure it has individual plans or thoughts beyond just a most basic desire to live which i think is kind of analogous to the way the old one in demon souls operates and potentially the way that the moon presence in bloodborne operates as well but uh this other stuff i'm not quite on board with just yet i'm curious to hear more though word outer simply refers to the fact that these concepts are outside of the principles espoused by the dominant religion of the lands between. Now that we have some context to understand what runes represent in Elden Ring, let's return to the theme of birth. When Melina turns our runes into strength, it's in a sense a kind of birth. It's the energy of life we've acquired being manifested into physical reality. The essence of life, the concepts and principles which defined the people that we've killed is brought into physical form. Only it's not a completely new form in the way that natural birth produces a new person, but rather that metaphysical material is integrated into our existing body. Similarly, when we reallocate our attributes with the amber egg, we are reorganizing the way that that life essence is physically expressed, and thus it's a kind of rebirth. What's important about this interpretation is that the metaphysical elements which define a person's identity don't necessarily remain as a cohesive whole after death. The runes which are reborn in our bodies when we level up could be described as pieces of a person's soul or identity. But when we integrate them into ourselves, we use them as pieces. We don't suddenly take on their characteristics in any meaningful way. If the Erd tree is made up of the same material, and people are reborn through the Erd Tree, this might explain why there's so much ambiguity regarding the identity of characters in Elden Ring. I think to also tie along with that, we can point to the way that remembrances can be literally reforged into weapons or skills slash spells. So, um, and this is something I've pointed out in my gold and silver video, Ania says that the Tarnished recoils from her offer to graft the champions or that have been hewn into the Erd Tree as like, like weapons and things like that. So it seems like 
this is a practice that seems very repulsive, perhaps, or disgusting. And I've wondered whether or not the reason for that is because it's literally taking somebody's identity and forcefully shaping it into something else. Which, if that's the case, it really does raise the question of what exactly are the mechanics of remembrance duping, especially when we use like the corpses of soulless demigods, I guess. So perhaps the reason, the way that soulless demigods work is that because their souls have been sapped from their bodies, the latent runes within them don't have any shape. So we take maybe the shape or the, like the literal memory of a demigod and use that as a kind of like mold or pressing for the runes that are left in that soulless demigod's body to create a duplicate. But of course, that's very, very heavy speculation there. One of the things I've struggled with in trying to understand Elden Ring's story is that I feel very uncertain in making the most basic logical assumptions, like that a character is themselves and not someone else. There are so many examples of odd parallels between various characters, twins and doubles and counterparts and so on, and it's difficult to say whether these connections are meaningful in a purely thematic sense or something more literal. But the theory... Yeah, and I think this is potentially, like, the worst thing that FromSoft did in terms of, like, making the lore cohesive is by having an actual, like, confirmation that Merica and Radigan were one character, and then adding on to it the way that Shabriri comes to possess Yura or Hayata kind of sort of comes to possess Arena. Because if you can't even be sure about the most basic nature of the identities of the others you encounter, it just really makes it difficult to have a solid basic understanding of the world, I guess. So... What I'm trying to say with that is it's it's like taking the whole like Velka theorizing from Dark Souls 1 and allowing it to run wild and to tie that into Elden Ring in a more concrete way is the way that like I think you can make the argument that like the Glomide Queen could have been Merica because Merica is Radigan and maybe the Glomide Queen was like what there was before there was Radigan and or Godfrey but not really, or wait, no, maybe it wasn't the Glomide Queen, maybe it was Melina, but wait, maybe Melina is also the Glomide Queen. Oh wait, maybe Melina is also Ronnie, you know, like, it's just, it's opened such a can of worms in that you could say that anybody is literally anybody else now, which makes Elden Ring lore kind of terrible to an analyze in, in very, in like, multiple levels here. Hopefully that makes sense. And, oh yeah, like, with Roger, like, even he is kind of questionable, like, whether or not he's still himself when we, like, find him in the uh, champion part of his questline. Although I know that's not what Spigat was talking about right then. There are inconsistencies uh, which hinder interpretations of the lore, which at some level they want us to analyze. Yeah. <laughs> Do I know that none of you are America? Because uh, I'm not your mom. <laughs> All right, anyway, going back to uh, Crunchy's video. The theory that I've proposed might make some sense out of this. If the Erd Tree is a figurative melting pot in which the metaphysical components of life are consolidated, and if people are born or reborn from the Erd Tree, it seems reasonable to assume that these pieces of the soul might get mixed up, blended together, or unnaturally divided, like adding several ingredients to a stew and then taking out a spoonful. Perhaps, like an alchemical mixture, the different aspects of the soul are separated and blended together to produce compounds in the form of so-called children. Perhaps this explains Radigan's origins. A mixture of bits of Merica and the fire giants she killed, and maybe some other people thrown in, like the long-vanished countrymen of Ohid. Melina, in particular, seems to be centered in a web of connections with other people. She's been variously connected with Ronnie, the Snowy Crone, the Glomide Queen, 
the twins Mikola and Melania, and Merica herself, but perhaps all of these connections are valid. If the components of the identities of these characters were created by or contributed to a single metaphysical mixture from which Melina was born, then she might express some of their characteristics. If the Erd Tree is a melting pot, a crucible of souls, so to speak, then every time that we ladle out some of that mixture, we're getting a cupful of everyone who ever died in the Lands Between. There's one final thing I'd like to address. That kind of reminds me of the whole, like, <laughs> theory that whenever you, like, drink a glass of water, you're more or less drinking recycled dinosaur pee. <laughs> at, at some point in history, like, there's, it's almost like a guaranteed fact that whatever glass of water you drink will have coursed through like the remains of a dinosaur at some point in history, <laughs> which is just kind of like very silly, but kind of crazy that it's, I think it's like actually kind of true, but I don't want to say that it really is though. Yeah. Because like, if you think about it, like the dinosaurs existed like millions of years ago. And like, if you like think about how the water cycle works, the water has all been like cycling since billions of years ago. There's a, it's just like a statistical like certainty that you were drinking some dinosaurs recycled water, you know? Now you gotta forget this what you drink now. Yeah, I'm the purveyor of cursed knowledge, apparently. <laughs> the ocean is ancient and a birth all life, just like the dark which is a question that's bugged me for a long time. Why is the marriage of Radigan and Renala treated with such importance? Muriel calls it a miracle, and symbolically it seems important that Radigan and Renala so closely match the image of the alchemical Red King of the Sun and White Queen of the Moon, which I explored previously in my video on alchemy. I get the sense that this marriage was the way things were supposed to happen, so to speak. Intuitively, it just feels like Radigan leaving Renala was an error at a profound metaphysical level. With the ideas I've proposed so far, I think there's a way to make sense of this, which also brings us back around to the theme of sex. Complex life depends greatly upon sexual reproduction. Although asexual life is still prone to mutation, the genetic variability in sexually produced offspring is much greater, which provides a lot of advantages in the species' ability to adapt to the environment through the process of natural selection. In particular, sex more readily emerges in evolution when the species is less adapted to their environment, or when the environment rapidly changes. In a dynamic and rapidly changing environment, the traits of a species which reproduces asexually, essentially cloning itself, will quickly become outdated and maladaptive. Sex allows various traits from different members of the species to be combined, producing a genetic mixture which can theoretically be more adaptive than any of the existing combinations of genes. What's true of genes could also be said to be true of memes. In other words, belief systems are subject to a process of natural selection analogous to that of biological life forms. A completely inflexible belief system rapidly becomes outdated in a dynamically changing environment. Many people have had this experience on a personal level. Being enmeshed in an echo chamber, in which you only hear the beliefs which agree with your own, usually leads to stagnation. Those ideas will never develop without the influence of other points of view. The development of ideas requires interaction between diverse belief systems, allowing those belief systems to figuratively have sex, producing conceptual offspring which synthesize the best traits of both worldviews. The Lands Between is a stagnant world. It's an inflexible system which only recycles life. The metaphysical concepts which define life are never developed. They never progress or integrate new concepts. In such a system... You make me feel like dancing! I wanna dance the night away! What the hell are you two doing? It's called rocking out! You wouldn't understand, Dad. You're not with it. I used to be with it, but then they changed what it was. 
Now what I'm with isn't it, and what's it seems weird and scary to me. It'll happen to you. I was muted there. Anyway, that's a metaphor there for Crunchy's sexual reproduction in terminology using memes. The only way to achieve order is through violence. Anomalies which don't fit into the current system have to be purged, and this genocidal philosophy characterized the early days of the Order of the Erd Tree, up until the marriage of Radigan and Renala, that is. That marriage is important because it wasn't just a marriage between two people, but also between two belief systems, two worldviews. The Order of the Erd Tree and the Fate of the Moon were conjoined. In my view, this is the central theme of Elden Ring. People have beliefs about the world, and those beliefs form a system of ideas which provides order to their lives. Differences between these conceptions of order generally lead to division and conflict, sometimes to a genocidal degree. But they don't have to. This division can be transcended through love, especially love for one's opponent, as in the case of Radigan and Renala. In the words of Pastor Muriel, heresy is not native to the world, it is but a contrivance. All things can be conjoined. To achieve peace, all we need to do is let our ideas have sex. Which is a bit ironic because that's like arguably the way they did things in Godfrey's time and then they just like moved away from it. Maybe like using Crunchy's terminology here, the world became too ordinary towards the end of the age of plenty. And so maybe they did no longer had the need to diverge so much with like the crucible traits coursing through all life. And so they wanted to homogenize things afterward. I don't know. Thank you for watching. The topic of sex is generally provocative and sometimes contentious, and at the moment there's a lot of high emotions towards the specific language used around sexual identity and expression in particular. So if you're unhappy with the way I've worded anything in this video, I encourage you to share your thoughts in a comment below. Partly because it will increase engagement for this video, which means I make more money, but also because I might actually be interested in what you have to say. When YouTubers tell me to like and subscribe, I usually don't out of stubbornness and spite, so I hope that you're all kinder than me and that you'll support this video and this channel. Finally, I'd like to thank several content creators who have helped develop the ideas behind this video. Smotown, Last Protagonist, Ratatoskr, oh, Hunt's Archaeologist, Casative, and a relatively small up-and-coming channel called TLGTW. If you're interested in exploring the ideas behind this video further, I've provided links to some specific videos from these creators, which inspired some of my previous thoughts. Once again, thank you for watching, and until next time, take care. Yeah, and I also want to watch his health in video. Um, I contemplated doing that one today, but I think it was a little bit shorter, and just in terms of like balancing out the stream time, I thought this would be a good one to go with first with a uh, charred thermos and honored madman so i did enjoy this video um as i've said before like crunchy has been a long time contributor to the channel and i <laughs> regretted not being able to like look at his stuff too much so i'm excited to do this now um i thought there were some really good ideas here and a lot of interesting parallels and i did enjoy it so if you guys enjoyed it as well and if you're kinder than crunchy go ahead and visit him over here and give him a like and or a subscribe. So, yeah. You're fine with sex talk. In fact, you encourage it. Well, you see, the birds and the bees. You appreciate the admittance about the algorithm. Yeah, it's really rough, like, how that works. I don't want to get, like, too into it, but... um. Yeah, just a solid video overall. I don't really think I had too much to disagree about it, and I don't think there was like anything for me to like really nitpick. It just kind of reminded me of other things, and I think our perspectives have grown as a consequence of that. 
So definitely looking forward to checking out his channel more in the future. But all right, uh, I think that's more or less going to be enough stalling for me. We're probably going to end the stream a little bit early, like a whole minute or so. And we'll catch you guys on the next one. I'm not sure when I'll be streaming again. I'll make either like a community post or something before that. Because I do want to take a little bit of time off to like dive into uh, Final Fantasy 16 for a bit. But for all of you who have been joining or joined for the first time, I appreciate that. Um, if you haven't joined the discord and we could continue to talk about lore and a bunch of other like game related stuff, very excited to see, uh, a lot of the things that were announced in the Nintendo direct today with like the new super Mario games, the star ocean remake, all that fun stuff there. So yeah, thanks again for joining. Take care. Last protagonist out.